What's up everyone, welcome back to a brand new video. At the time of this video's upload, it's the two year anniversary of my channel. It's crazy to think that I've been around that long, and I'm grateful for all the support along the way. But with how long I've been here, there's been one thing that a lot of people have asked me to do. To the point where it's kind of a running joke in my comments now. No, I'm not talking about what if Kanye was in Dragon Ball. I'll get around to that soon though. Jokes aside, the one big suggestion that everyone's been saying is what if I was in Dragon Ball. It's a really weird concept. And apparently others have done it too, and I wasn't really too sure how to go about this. It is a weird concept after all, but I think I found a way to make it interesting. But there's a catch that comes alongside it. You'll see as we start this video. Anyways, let's begin the story. So the biggest problem was trying to figure out how to put myself in here. I did a poll a few weeks ago asking what species the character should be. And a lot of people said I should do Bioandroid, because my avatar is based on Cell after all. But that posed an issue. For one, turning Cell into myself wouldn't really work and I don't really know how to go about that. Plus, if it was me, I could just cheat the system, it wouldn't really be that fun. Like realistically, if it was me in there, I would basically find a way to speedrun the whole series, aiming for the Super Dragon Balls and wishing for whatever I want. It's a smart move, but it wouldn't be fun. Another option was to use my avatar as a main character, this purple guy right here. And I like that idea, but the issue is, its origin story is really weird, like really weird, trust me. Going off script here, but the whole origin behind it, it's Cell absorbing Mr. Incredible. Yeah, it's its a long story. Please please don't ask about it. I don't know myself either. But yeah, I don't know how that would work in the story, and if I did it, Mickey Mouse would come to my house and personally kill me because I violated their copyright, so... Yeah, not doing that. Instead, I found a better idea. One that makes an original character based on that avatar. And kind of based on my personality. And no, it's not going to be some super strong hero with all the knowledge Dragon Ball that I have. You'll see as we go forward. So, how are we supposed to put a bio-android in the series? Well, let's rewind, and give a little backstory on this new character. Let's go back to after the Red Ribbon arc. As we know, Dr. Jirobe was one of the survivors of the Red Ribbon army, and then he started creating androids in order to get revenge on Goku. This is where we'll implement a change. Jiro is starting to work on his weapon. He wants to make an ultimate android, one strong enough to kill Goku and enact his revenge. And he feels the best way to go about that is to make a bioengineered one. Basically, consider this the beta version of Cell. He wants to try and test it out first. For simplicity, he codenames this project Salad. And he begins his research, just like he did with Cell. His idea is to get some drones to go out and find out info about all the other fighters around Goku. Maybe that way, he'll gather data on the fighters and their DNA. With all the knowledge of all these fighters, he can create a really strong opponent, using the help of one of his powerful computers and his great mind. It takes a bit of time for him to begin the process, but eventually he has it all planned out, and the 22nd World Tournament comes around. This is where he begins spying, getting DNA and info from Goku, Krillin, and Roshi. Eventually, he sees Tenshin on too. He seems pretty strong, so he gets data from him as well. And hey, while he's at it, he may also research Yamcha, and even though she's not a fighter, maybe getting some of Bulma's DNA might help, gathering her intelligence as well as Jero's. But he still needs more, and luckily for him, this tournament leads into the King Piccolo arc and he gets some DNA from Piccolo too. This should be good, it'll give this android more evil influence, and it'll give him more power. He even has one of his drones observe Piccolo Jr., who's born right after King Piccolo dies, following him around as he trains, and trying to follow around Goku as he goes to Kami. But the drones can't reach Kami's lookout, so that's kind of an issue there. Although, the 23rd World Tournament gives another opportunity. These drones study more of the fights. Goku vs. Chi-Chi, Krillin vs. Piccolo, Goku vs. Ten Shinhan, and Goku vs. Piccolo. Plus, the weird encounter between Piccolo and that one guy that was in the tournament. Who is actually Kami in disguise? The drones keep an eye on him, and once Kami actually shows up later on, he's actually able to get some DNA from Kami. Assuming he's pretty strong because he looks like Piccolo. Probably another one of those demon people. It's been years at this point, and he's gotten a lot of data and DNA. Jiro's pretty confident now. The bio android is growing a lot stronger and has some great potential. Right now we're around the end of Dragon Ball, and he starts preparing the android to be born. This is during the time skip between the 23rd World Tournament and the Saiyan Saga. Eventually, the computer finally creates the android, feeding it more info as it's released. But Jiro then notices there's an issue. This android is growing too powerful. Jiro needs to stop it before it grows too strong. He doesn't want it to be uncontrollable. Plus, it's even getting too strong for the computer's capabilities. It's becoming sentient earlier on than it should have. Jiro frantically goes to the computer, trying to fix this issue. But as he does, he hears glass shattering behind him as all the liquid pours out of the container. There's a massive explosion. Luckily, he's able to make it out alive. But his lab is all but destroyed. Standing there in front of him is a purple humanoid with very alien-like features. 
since he was released early, he's actually in an imperfect state. This isn't how he was intended to be, and Jiro fears the worst. If he escaped this early, that means he's probably not going to abide by his commands. This android tries to get a sense of where he is and what he's doing, as Jiro tries to control him. The android collects all his thoughts, and realizes what's happening. He doesn't want to be controlled by Jiro. He knows Jiro might have a vendetta against him. He's cunning, he's already caught on. Instead, he makes his escape, attacking Jiro to hold him off, hastily getting out of the lab as he grabs some drones to go with him, not really sure what to do now. The android makes it far away, and he's pretty frantic right now. I mean, he's sentient and knows who he is and what he is. He's the amalgamation of all these other people, genetically engineered in order to kill. He hides out in a forest now, not sure what to do. There's thoughts in his head telling him to kill Goku, but there's also other thoughts. His own mind, his consciousness, it's overpowering all that. He wants to be independent, but he still struggles to grasp what he really is. Yeah, he knows what he is, but he can't quite accept it. He looks into a pond nearby, getting a glimpse at his appearance. And there he sees something horrific. He looks like a monster. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't even know his own name, if he has one. There's only one code name that he's ever gone by, Salad. And now, we have the birth of a brand new character. He has a bit of evil in him, thanks to both of the Piccolos and the old data that he has on Ten Shinhan when he was a bad guy. The reason he's even struggling is because the other DNA inside of him. He has people that are pure of heart, specifically Goku and Kami. Kami's one of the big factors though, and that's why I mentioned him before. His DNA is what really jumpstarts Salad. I mean, think about it. He expelled Pickle from him and he has a purely good heart. He's literally God after all. We'll get into why this is more important later on. Salad doesn't know what to do now, but he decides one thing. He doesn't want to be a pawn to anyone. He doesn't want to be Jiro's device. He wants to be his own person, not a killing machine made for Jiro and only Jiro. But that's the thing. Besides that, he doesn't know what his purpose is. He has immense power and potential. But if he were to go out into society, I mean, look at him. He won't be accepted at all. He's a monster. But maybe he could fix this. He knows he's still imperfect, not at the true potential that Jiro intended. If he aims for that, he could fix himself. But he doesn't know how to do that. See, it's not like Cell where he has to absorb two androids to become perfect. The computer was intended to do that for Salad, but he was released before that happened. And now with the lab destroyed and Jiro after him, he's on his own. We'll leave him alone for a bit and go over to the other characters. We skip to the Saiyan Saga. Once Raditz arrives on Earth, he detects a few high powers. One of them's Piccolo. He meets up with him and realizes that this isn't Kakarot. He senses another one though, but it disappears really quickly. It was actually Salad that he was sensing, and Salad sensed that Raditz was getting closer and got worried that he was being hunted. Whoever this guy was was pretty strong, and he assumed it was one of Jero's androids, another one that he made in order to kill Salad. He lowered his power and hid away, hoping that he wouldn't be detected. Raditz doesn't pay any mind to this, his scouter was probably bugging out. So, he forgets it and goes to the other high power, which actually does turn out to be Kakarot. His encounter with Goku and friends goes pretty normal. Piccolo and Goku team up, going to save Gohan from Raditz, and the two rivals begin their fight against the Saiyan. Salad continues hiding out, still worried about this guy. He doesn't know what else this could be. It has to be something that Jiro made. If he really needed to, he can kill Jiro pretty easily. But if Jiro has a new minion, who knows? He doesn't know how that'll turn out. As he's panicking, he then senses a fight, going to see what's happening. It's the same guy he sensed before. And from what keys he could feel, it seems like he's fighting against Goku and Piccolo. This has to be something that Jiro created. There's no way there would be someone this strong on Earth, especially since it's going after Goku. He doesn't want to go close though. He takes one of his drones and hides in the mountain nearby, throwing the drone to go observe the fight. The drones begin collecting data on the fight. This man is unknown, but they study his DNA and bring it back to Salad. He sees that it's an alien like Goku. Yeah, they actually know that Goku's an alien by now. After collecting his DNA, they realize it's not one of an Earthly. It's just too different. Sure, they know he was a monkey boy or something, and it might be attributed to that, but a better theory is that he might be from outer space. They don't know for sure though, but what Salad and the drones can tell though, is that this guy has some relation to Goku. Whatever species or mutation that Goku is, this guy has the same thing. Salad begins theorizing. Is it some genetic duplication of Goku that Jiro made in the lab? Or is it actually someone from outer space? The technology he's wearing on his face, and the armor, it's nothing like he's ever seen before. The drones keep observing, and Salad contemplates joining the fight. He doesn't know though, if he does join, he might be attacked by both parties. And what would be the purpose of even joining? He wonders if he should get involved, but before he could even come to a conclusion, Piccolo then launches this attack. Some weird beam that Salad has never seen before. Except for earlier in the fight. Piccolo tried this before and it missed, but now, it makes a direct hit. Hitting Goku and the guy that's now identified as Goku's brother. Thanks to the drones picking up their conversations. 
It looks like he hesitated a bit too much, because now, there's no Goku to help. And this invader is dead, but he listens into the conversation and gets a gist of what's happening. And here's something terrifying. This guy is a Saiyan, which he assumes is an alien race that Goku is part of too. Again, he missed a lot of the context, so he's trying to piece this together. From what he hears from Raditz, two more Saiyans will arrive in a year, aiming to get their revenge and destroy Earth. He thinks they're screwed. Goku's now dead, and he's not sure himself what to do. He goes to hide away again, sort of in a panic trying to formulate a plan. But he can't keep hiding forever. He contemplates more and realizes what he has to do. If he wants to survive, he's going to have to fight against the Saiyan threat somehow. But there's one big issue. He would have to team up with everyone else, Piccolo and all the humans. He doesn't know if they'll accept him. Maybe they'll see him as a threat, and they'll come to kill him. See, Salad isn't weak. No, he was made strong by Jiro. That's pretty obvious. The issue is, he's never been in conflict before or shown off his power. He doesn't really know how much is in there. And that's why he's not too confident right now. But he's slowly beginning to realize. He could harness this. There has to be something more within him. He just needs to learn more about this power. And there's only one person he can think of consulting. If he goes to the humans, they'll probably attack him. He is a threat after all. But maybe there's one person he can relate to. Let's move forward a bit. Out in the wilderness, Piccolo has started his training with Gohan. Gohan is left completely alone, with Piccolo watching nearby, trying to remain low. Piccolo then senses something, an unfamiliar key getting closer. Well, at first it seems unfamiliar, but the more he focuses, the more he gets creeped out. He senses Goku, he senses Krillin, Tenshinhan, Yamcha, a bunch of other powers, and most scary of all, he senses himself and King Piccolo, the Demon King and himself, the reincarnation of him. Piccolo thinks this might be another threat coming after him and Gohan. He gets ready to fight. But this figure approaches really casually. He begins questioning who he is and why he's here. He looks like some sort of alien, and Salad tries to get Piccolo to calm down, saying he's not here to fight. But Piccolo's not stupid. He thinks this could be a trick, and he keeps his guard up. He tells Salad to explain quickly or he'll fight. And frantically, he begins speaking, giving an abridged version of his backstory. Piccolo's confused. The Red Ribbon Army? They were destroyed a while ago. And now there's this android, and he has all the DNA of all these people around him. This has to be some sort of joke. He wants to know who this guy truly is. He tells him to start talking before he kills him. But then the two of them hear a voice in their head. It's Kami. Piccolo gets mad, telling Kami to not invade his thoughts like that. But he tells Piccolo to trust him. Salad is surprised. First of all, why is Kami siding with him? And second of all, how does Kami even know who he is? Kami begins explaining. He knew of Salad's existence, and know that he's part of Salad now. His DNA is in him after all. Wait, what? This comes as a surprise to both of them. Piccolo's surprised that Kami kept this from everyone, and Salad's surprised that Kami even knew. Obviously, Kami's a pretty smart guy. He always saw those drones flying around. He saw it at the 23rd World Tournament, and the whole reason he noticed it in the first place is because they tried to come up on his lookout. I mean, he does dictate who comes on the lookout after all, and he would see this thing trying to make it up there. That's when he started observing more, eventually finding out about the existence of this android. He senses evil in him, but also good. He's conflicted right now. But more importantly, he tells Piccolo that this guy's telling the truth. Not only about his origin, but about his intention. He wants to help against the Saiyans. And he had a good reason for hiding out this whole time. He tells Piccolo to just sense it. He's one of them. The DNA of both Piccolo's and Kami. The DNA of Goku. Everyone else. And he's trying to get some purpose out of his life. He's not a lab experiment gone wrong. It's an independent, sentient, and conscious being. Reluctantly, Piccolo drops his guard. Asking him if he's truly up for the challenge. He saw Raditz after all. And apparently the two people heading to Earth are much stronger than him. Especially because he was made to kill Goku after all. Is he really going to side with him? and Goku's allies. Salad tells Piccolo that his life is at risk too. If he doesn't do this, Earth will be destroyed and he'll die. And after all, if he truly was after Goku, that would just make him Drew's pawn, the one thing that he doesn't want to be. Piccolo realizes now that all this is the truth, just like Kami was saying. Well, they have a lot of work to do. Not only does he need to get introduced to everyone else, but it seems he's in a similar situation to Gohan. He doubts his power, but Piccolo and Kami can tell. He has much more potential within him than he knows. And they're going to make use of that. Piccolo will whip him into shape. If he truly wants to be an independent being accepted by others, he'll listen to Piccolo now. When we left off, Salad met Piccolo, and with some unexpected help from Kami, he was able to convince the Namekian to help him train. Although no one really knows each other, it seems like they're joining forces now. Salad isn't really too sure what to do. But recognizes that he shouldn't go by what Jiro says. Jiro wanted him to kill Goku. Why not go against that by helping Goku? Not to mention, it's clear that Goku's not the bad guy here. Salad's not stupid. He knows Jiro is the bad one. Goku didn't really do anything wrong. It's all some plot from Jiro to get revenge. He brought Salad into this specifically because of that. Therefore, he decided his best to train with all the heroes. 
At first, most of his time is spent with Piccolo, who's also trying to juggle training with Gohan. Having an extra training partner is really great, especially because Salad seems pretty strong. No one is too sure about his full strength yet because he's never used it. But Piccolo aims to bring out that latent strength, just like he's doing with Gohan. Not only that, Salad also has a lot of technical prowess. Even though he's never really fought before, I mean, think about it. He's built on all the research from all the other fighters, so he has all their techniques and knows all their fighting styles. He just hasn't used it yet, but as he trains more and more, he begins to realize what truly is in him. It's just as Jiro intended. He's an incredibly strong warrior, but just needs to learn how to control that power and access it. It seems to be all muscle memory, and all he has to do is put that to use. One thing that I didn't really discuss too much in the last part is the intelligence of Salad. Not me, I'm talking about the character. I got like a, I got like a room temperature IQ, in all honesty. Anyways, he has all the knowledge of Jiro, Jiro's computer, and all the other fighters. He'd probably be the smartest in the group, even smarter than Piccolo even. Again, he's also part Bulma. And genetics in Dragon Ball work really weird, so I'm gonna assume he inherits the intelligence too, even though that's not how it'll work in real life, but whatever, I'm not gonna question it. Just a weird thing to note. That short spiel aside, his intelligence is actually gonna come in handy. One of the great things is that when Raditz died, they were able to get his scouter. Well, it was all broken into little pieces, but they still got it. And Sal is able to use it and reverse engineer it somehow. Try to get a hold of the tech inside of that, in order to incorporate it within his drones. He's starting to build more and more. Maybe during the battle with the Saiyans, this will come in handy. He can not only gather their DNA, but also get more info on them. Plus, if he implements scouter technology, they could use that power level thing that Raditz had. Although they're not too sure about how that system works, but they'll make do with it. The humans are still kind of wary of Salad. I mean, he is from the Red Ribbon Army after all. After some time, they grow to like him more, but still, there is that suspicion. It's just like with Piccolo. They didn't really trust Piccolo right away, and it took a lot of time for him to gain their trust. It would be kind of a similar situation here, especially now with two villains in the group. They come to learn more and more that Salad's actually really powerful, not only in terms of techniques, but all the abilities he has. He has all of Piccolo's abilities, you know, healing, being able to stretch his limbs, all that kind of stuff not to mention Kami's abilities, and Goku's. Just like how Cell has, he's able to get Zenkai's when he gets hurt. Coupled with his regeneration, it's a really helpful thing. Once he gets hurt, he just regenerates and gets stronger. Although, it's not nearly to the extent that Cell has it. And just like Cell, he doesn't have infinite energy, so it's not like he can do this infinitely. But still, it's useful during training and he knows that he can take advantage of it. Speaking of Goku, he actually wonders what Goku's up to. He hasn't met Goku yet for a pretty obvious reason but they're sure whatever he's doing, it's effective. Salad's actually aiming for a new form, if anything. He isn't perfect, just like we mentioned in the last part, but he can work his way up there. You see, unlike Cell, it's not like he could just absorb some androids and get perfect that way. No. Salad was released way too early. If he had some more years of development, Jiro was planning for his perfect form to be made right away. The thing is, all of that data and all that info to get to the perfect form is still within Salad. He just doesn't know how to access it. We'll be talking about this more as the scenario goes on. If Salad continues training and collecting data, he hopes that he can reach the perfect form in this way. And who knows, maybe others around him have transformations too. Maybe he could take advantage of that. Who knows though? As training continues, Salad would probably grow close with Gohan and Piccolo. He's around them more than anyone else. And also, I do want to base some of the character off me like I mentioned in the last part. And you guys should all know by now that Piccolo and Gohan are my favorite characters, so let me have this one. Let this one slide. The group has come up with a lot of new strategies in terms of power. Not only are they coming up with great combo attacks, but Salad is helping them grow stronger since he is another strong ally. He splits his time between training with Piccolo and Gohan, as well as training with Kami and all the humans. Kami wanted to make sure that Salad came to see him. Ever since he began watching Salad, he wanted to make sure that Salad would come to him one day to train. He is part Kami after all. He may as well harness that side of him. Not just because of all the Namekian stuff, but because Kami actually has some great abilities as Guardian. This is a bit harder for Salad to develop, which is why Kami comes in. But he's gonna keep this in mind going forward. He can learn some great techniques from Kami and train further to get stronger and learn newer abilities. Abilities that are exclusive to him. But with all that covered, I think we've shown enough of the training. Now we can actually head into the Saiyan Saga itself. Of course, Goku's gonna be the same strength. Salad would actually be the second strongest of the group. As I mentioned before, he grows incredibly fast, not only due to his data, but because of his biology. He's part Saiyan after all. So let's place him at around 7,000. Piccolo is actually way stronger than he was normally thanks to this great training partner. Plus, with how close he is with Salad, he was training with him more than anyone. That puts him at around 6,000. Gohan actually gets the same effect too, putting him at 3,000. And as for the humans, they're around the same, if not a bit stronger. Just for simplicity and to give them a bit of a buff, let's say that they're about 2,000 each. At least Krillin, Tenshinhan, and Yamcha. 
The group's ready to fight, waiting for the two Saiyans to arrive. Their arrival goes pretty much the same. They land in a city, with Nappa destroying it just because he feels like it. He and Vegeta are eventually led to the area where the other fighters are waiting. Already, they've walked into a trap without knowing it. Before the fight even began, Salad already deployed some drones in the area. This way he could study Vegeta and Nappa more effectively, as well as getting DNA samples from them, probably powering himself up even more. And this will also help him adapt easier in the fight, as well as helping the others too. Right away, Nappa deployed some Cybermen, with each of them splitting up and trying to go for one of the other fighters. Of course Nappa knows the Cybermen aren't too strong, but splitting them up should work as a good distraction. It keeps all the fighters occupied. Of course a lot of the fighters have an easy time taking them on, even defeating some of them. Then the Cybermen decide to explode, and they aim for the weakest fighters. They look over to see Yamcha and Chiaotzu. And while the Cybermen are involved in their own fights, they all group up on these two. Piccolo and Salad are able to stretch their arms out and grab two of them, flinging them over towards Nappa where they blow up. But some of the other Cybermen got away and couldn't be stopped, killing Yamcha and Chiaotzu in the process. It was a dirty trick and by doing this, they were able to actually kill those two. But even then Nappa's still surprised. They only took out two fighters, the rest of them were fine, and if anything that only served to anger them. Plus when Piccolo and Salad grabbed two of them and threw them at Nappa, they injured him a bit, although it wasn't that bad. But still, that served to piss him off too. Both groups are angry, especially Tenshin and Krillin. But with the Cybermen now gone, that obviously means it's Nappa's turn to fight. The person he faces off against is Piccolo. He assumes that Piccolo is one of the stronger ones there, but still weak enough for him to defeat. This should also be interesting, the Namekian and then whatever that other purple thing is. Nappa doesn't really care about fighting the humans, they won't be fun to battle. Piccolo's confident that he can take on Nappa alone, and he's right. The two go into battle right away, pacing themselves. At first, it actually starts out as kind of a balanced fight. The two of them trade blows and are impressed with each other's power. Not that they're going to commend each other or anything, it's just worth noting. They acknowledge the other's strength, and begin powering up more during the fight. Nappa notices on a scouter that Piccolo's power is climbing. At first it was only about a thousand, now it's climbing to two thousand, three thousand, five thousand, six thousand? No, that's gotta be a mistake. Before he can even comprehend what he's seeing, Nappa's punched in the face by Piccolo, now fully powered up. He loses sight of Piccolo until he appears behind Nappa, hitting him with another powerful attack. Supportive material shows that Nappa's actually had a power of four thousand, and with Piccolo at six thousand, well, that's a pretty considerable gap, enough for Piccolo to easily overwhelm the Saiyan, then killing him. Even though he was able to defeat Nappa pretty easily, there's still an issue. First of all, two of the fighters already died, including Chiaotu who can't be revived again, and now Vegeta will be the one to fight next, and Goku still hasn't arrived yet. They need more time, but Vegeta's angered and ready to battle. It looks like they're just going to have to hold him off for a bit until Goku arrives, but he might be here soon. They could sense him. They just need to buy a few more minutes. The group all bonds together, ganging up on Vegeta. Salad uses some drones to look at the power levels of everyone, calculating that maybe collectively they might stand a chance. Actually, if you combine everyone's powers, they're stronger than Vegeta collectively. But the issue is power levels aren't everything, plus all those powers are split up amongst everyone, making things tougher. At best, all they can really do right now is hold them off. But Salad begins thinking of an idea. They might not need to do that. In the midst of battle, he throws something on the ground quickly, then standing back as he takes on a certain posture. He tells everyone to move out of the way and they jump away from Vegeta, as Salad then yells Mafuba. This is something he picked up from Kami, and I guess Tenshinhan and Roshi too, but mainly Kami. He actually has perfect mastery over this technique, and he thinks that maybe using it against Vegeta is their best bet. And it seems like it's going to work. He draws his arms down, sealing Vegeta in the container. And just as he's about to seal it, a massive explosion occurs. They don't know where it came from or who did it, but it negated the technique. Vegeta's now freed. They all look over and see. It turns out Piccolo didn't actually finish the job against Nappa. He's still alive. Well, not anymore. He used the last of his power to free Vegeta hoping that Vegeta will be able to kill everyone and avenge him. He used his giant storm attack, using up the last of what little energy he had left, and now he's actually dead. But this kind of messed things up. Vegeta was weakened by the Mafuba, and doesn't know what exactly happened, but he's angrier now, even angrier than he was before. Just to make sure that doesn't happen again, he shoots the container that Salad used. No more cheap tricks. Enraged, he lunges towards the group, but is suddenly hit in the back of the head by someone's elbow. Everyone looks on with a smile as they see Goku's here. Glad that he's finally back. Although, Goku's a bit confused. Who's this purple guy? Oh wait, King Kai actually told him a bit about Salad, but he didn't know too much himself. He heard he was some strong guy that the Red Ribbon Army made, kinda like Android 8 he compares him to. He'd like to learn more about this guy, but of course they're in the middle of a fight right now, and Vegeta's only angrier, especially now that he sees Kakarot here. But this just turned the tide of the battle. 
instead of just holding Vegeta off, having Goku here means they can actually defeat him in a battle. He's a bit concerned about the synergy of their fight, but they tell him not to worry. Everyone's been training together and they have great synergy. And as for Salad, he could perfectly replicate Goku's style, having studied it for basically his whole life. That's kind of weird, but also kind of cool. Goku won't question it, though. That's going to be a big help here. Quickly, Vegeta begins losing ground. Now he has all these people against him, and with Kakarot there, that's just the boost in power that they needed. He was a bit injured from the Mafuba too, wearing him out a bit. Goku would have loved a great one-on-one -on -one fight, but with all these other people here, and the severity of the situation, they realize they need to defeat Vegeta right away. And even though Vegeta's close to defeat, he still has one last trick up his sleeve. Quickly, he creates a fake moon, throwing it up at the sky, then transforming into a great ape, before anyone even realizes what happens. Salad immediately recognized this, wondering if that means he, Goku, and Gohan will transform too. Of course, Gohan transforms, but since he doesn't have a tail and Goku doesn't, they stay fine. He doesn't actually know too much about this ability. Obviously, he's never seen the artificial moon or anything like that, or any antic with the Uzaru form. But thankfully, Kami actually filled everyone in. They know that the tail is a weak spot, and in order to negate this transformation, they just need to cut that off. It's simple enough, and Salad has a great idea. He splits himself into two. The copy of Salad is a lot weaker, so he doesn't have to give up too much power. He'll use his main body to help the others and distract Vegeta, while the other one's gonna go cut off the tail. As for Gohan, right now he's fighting Vegeta and acting as the main distraction, with Krillin confident enough to try and cut off Gohan's tail himself. He and Salad's clone coordinate their attack. Together, both of them create a Kienza. Gohan doesn't notice because he's completely berserk right now in this state. Obviously, Vegeta has full control, but he doesn't notice Salad because he didn't know that he made a clone. So, just as quickly as he transformed, he returns back to normal. And with that done, he has no means of escaping, no way to win, and no other tricks up his sleeve. He's on the ground at the mercy of everyone. And most of them think that they should kill Vegeta. But Goku decides they might want to spare him, just like he did originally. I feel like not much about that decision would change, and they would all trust Goku's judgment as Vegeta goes away. But still, there are some differences with how this arc ends. For one, Goku was a lot less injured here. Instead of basically his entire body being broken, he's in pretty good shape. Sure, he has a little bit of injuries, but it's not that bad. Same goes for everyone else too. Not to mention, Tenshin on the Piccolo are alive. Originally, they died. And obviously, Salad's here too. But they didn't get off scot-free. Yamcha and Chaozu are gone. Sure, they could revive Yamcha, but they'd still have to wait a year for the Dragon Balls. But as for Chaozu, that's kind of an issue. He's already been revived once, so they can't do it again with the Dragon Balls on Earth. But Krillin has a great idea of where they can go to find more. Namek. If Namek actually has Dragon Balls like Earth, maybe they could revive Chaozu and Yamcha. And they wouldn't have to wait a year to revive Yamcha either. It's a good idea and it might actually work. And with Goku in great shape, and more fighters overall, it may be a safe trip. Or at least, they hope so. They begin planning for this. And in the meantime, let's go over to Dr. Jiro. We haven't touched upon him since the last part, but he's still around waiting trying to think of what to do. He still does want to kill Goku, but he also wants to find Salad and kill him too. He can't have one of his creations running around like this. He doesn't know what Salad's up to. Maybe Salad's planning revenge against him. Maybe he'll try to take over the world. He doesn't know, but he knows that he wants Salad gone. But what would be strong enough to defeat him? He doesn't want to try another bio android because that failed miserably the first time. This time he could actually make an android but using a human blueprint. That might actually work better. He begins working on androids early on, using some human test subjects. He has his eye on two people that he's going to kidnap and turn into androids, twins named Lapis and Lazuli, but he also has a brand new android that's going to join his ranks, a former enemy of Goku's, one that has great fighting abilities and a reason to kill Goku. Lapis and Lazuli would be great backup plans, as androids 17 and 18, but more importantly, Jiro's new ally is someone to watch out for, a certain mercenary that already got turned into a cyborg, with Jiro promising to improve his cyborg parts greatly. Last time, we saw what the group was deciding to do. The best course of action was to obviously try and go to Namek, seeing if they have any Dragon Balls so they could revive the people that died. And if it doesn't have Dragon Balls there, well, it's at least worth a shot to check. I'm gonna make one minor change to the last part, one that I didn't really clarify too much. They did spare Vegeta, but instead of him going away, he's gonna stay here. Even though everyone hates him, they might be useful for him. Maybe in the future they could help him defeat Frieza. And if he goes with them to Namek, maybe he can get Dragon Balls for himself. He's interested and wants to go. One of the great things here is that Goku can actually follow them this time. Instead of him falling behind because he needs to heal, he's actually okay. His injuries weren't too bad. Sure, he is beat up a bit, but nothing a few days of rest won't fix. He'll be joining everyone on the trip, and pretty much the whole group's going, besides Yamcha and Chaozu, obviously. As for Vegeta, he's obviously the one that's beat up the most. And as you could probably guess, they don't really know what to do with him. 
He is a bad guy after all, and they could just leave him here on Earth, but they don't really trust him alone. It's probably better for them to bring him along. That way, they can make sure he's actually okay, while also making sure he doesn't pull any stunts on Earth. And they don't really expect the need for any sort of firepower, but if they do actually need to fight someone, Vegeta is another fighter that they could use help from. Think about it, once he heals, he'll be more of a help if anything, he's gonna get a lot stronger from getting a boost in power. Especially considering how his injuries are worse than pretty much anyone else's. Like I said, the group doesn't think they need that many people, but they all wanna go. How often do you get to go into space? I mean, it just sounds fun to do regardless. So, they're all gonna end up going, which will actually work out well in the end considering what's gonna happen later on, and you'll see as this part continues. They just think the idea of space travel is cool. So the whole group is pumped up. Bulma is able to make a ship with the help of Salad because of his intelligence, as well as some help from Popo and Kami, and surprisingly, some help from Vegeta. He does have a ship here after all, and Bulma is able to reverse engineer it, trying to figure out the tech inside of it to use in her own ship. It's a weird but also fun experience for her. She gets to see all this weird alien technology, not only from the Saiyans, but the ship that Kami arrived on Earth in. Plus, working with Salad is a kind of weird experience for her. He is a bug android looking type thing, but it's interesting to see how he works. He is smart after all, and she's able to tell that pretty easily. He has a lot of Jero's knowledge too, which could be pretty useful, not to mention a lot of her knowledge, so he works well with her. It takes some time, but they're able to finally build a ship. Including some interesting technology on there, such as a gravity chamber suggested by Vegeta, considering how Earth's gravity is so weak compared to something like planet Vegeta. The ship is massive and has its own training area, so all the people on the ship can actually train in that gravity room. Since it is going to take some time to actually get to Namek, they'll need something to do. Training is the perfect thing, they'll get stronger on the way there. With all the arrangements set in place, they all board the ship and head off to Namek, leaving Earth. Since we talked about him a bit in the last part, let's talk about Jiro now. As I mentioned, he has a brand new android, one that he could trust, another Red Ribbon collaborator, someone who also hates Goku. He has a lot in common with Jiro. He probably hates Goku more than him actually. I mean, look how Goku scarred him. Obviously the person I'm talking about is Tao who's already been turned into a cyborg, but not really a great cyborg. I mean, there's no infinite energy or anything. Look how he lost to Shinhan in the 23rd World Tournament. If he were an android that Jiro made, he would have been way more powerful. The great thing is, with him already being a cyborg, it's not too much to change with him. Jiro already has what he needs to work with. The cybernetic parts are already installed on Tao. All Jiro needs to do is upgrade him, which shouldn't be too tough. This is pretty interesting for him. It's the first time he's actually working with humans to turn into an android. He does have a project way down the road for Android 17 and 18, but it's better to work with Tao first, someone who's already got these parts installed and someone who's willing to collaborate. Obviously Tao would agree to this, getting modified to be stronger and to have infinite energy, that's great, it'll allow him to defeat Goku easily. Not only satisfying himself, but satisfying Jiro in the process. So Jiro begins working. His goal is to eliminate Salad as well, since he is a rogue Asian and he doesn't really trust him. For all he knows, Salad is plotting to come back and kill him sometime. Not to mention he teamed up with Goku of all people. He doesn't want that. He can't have one of his creations running around acting good. And because of that, he only has two simple goals right now. Kill Goku and kill Salad. And like I mentioned, he does have plans for other androids, including 17 and 18, who are also human-based androids. But he hasn't started those yet. He would like to make another bio-android, though. And he actually does have plans for a concept called Cell. But he isn't entirely sure, just as I mentioned last time. It may be a little bit too risky. I mean, the last time he made a bio-android, look what happened. He doesn't know if Cell would be the same. If he does start working on Cell, it would take longer, and Cell might not even obey him. He is a pretty similar concept to Salad, so he's not too sure if he wants to create Cell, but he'll keep that in mind. However, he does continue building other androids as well. He's not just going to work on Tap. He may also modify himself in the future, turning him into an android. Alongside all that, though, he's planning to possibly build the best artificial human yet, a project simply titled... Android 13. Oh yeah, he's finally being brought into one of my scenarios. With the group leaving now, this gives him a lot of time to work on building these new androids, specifically his favorite project so far, Android 13. Modifying Tao is great and all, but having another android? That would be even better, it would assure that they'd get stuff done. Besides this project labeled Android 13, he is working on some other side projects, two androids to go along with him, 14 and 15. Slowly but surely, he's building his army, Tao, 13. 14, 15, and in case those don't work, he has plans for 17, 18, 19, 20, even Cell. He's got so much on his mind, and he's confident. If one thing fails, he has another project, and if that fails, he can go on to that. But as far as he's concerned right now, Tao and Android 13 should be enough, as well as 14 and 15 along with that. 
Work begins on the Red Ribbon Redneck. And with that covered, let's go back to the main group on Namek. We'll see more of the Red Ribbon Androids in the next part. Obviously on the way to Namek, everyone's going to be gravity training. It's the best thing to do right now. And it was a great suggestion from Vegeta. It's a really effective form of training, and they do need something to occupy them in their downtime. Of course, this would make everyone a lot stronger. We saw this with Goku on his way to Namek in the original series. He got really strong, multiple times stronger than he was before. So, the same is going to happen with the group. Let's cover some power levels a bit because that's an easy way to show where they are in terms of strength. Salad would be at the top. With his great potential as a bio-android, we'll put him at around 180k. I know he's based on my character and he's kind of a self-insert, but I promise I'm not doing it to show favoritism, it's just because he's a bio-android and realistically if he were training, he would be like this. And to be fair, I could make him way more overpowered than he is. But I think this is fair, so don't judge me, don't judge me. That little tangent aside, for Goku, he's at 150k, the second strongest of the group. Vegeta would be around 100k. Since he's injured, he wouldn't be doing too much training, but having a Zenkai boost would help him grow. As for Piccolo, he's at 80k, with Gohan close behind at 60k. The humans are also a lot stronger than normal, but they're the weakest of the group. Tenchenon and Krillin are both at 30k, with Yamcha at 25k, thanks to all his training on King Kai's planet. He's there with Chaozu, who's at around 9k. Yeah, they're not going to be involved in this part, but let's cover them anyways. Throw them a bone so you guys know what they're up to. They're not just waiting there in Otherworld doing nothing. And yeah, that seems pretty weak, but considering how strong Yamcha is in the main series, this is actually way better than where he was at this point. After some more travel time, the group finally arrives at Namek. But when they get there, they notice something weird out in space. There's other ships flying around, and Vegeta then realizes, they must have been tracked somehow. They were working with the Frieza Force technology after all to make their ships. And he begins to realize, they may have actually forgot about something. Maybe one of the technologies had some sort of tracker in it. No, that actually isn't the case. Salad and Bulma knew that this may be an issue, so they made sure to remove any sort of tracking devices. They must have had someone watching, if anything. And that theory is actually correct. Without anyone knowing, Frieza actually sent some scouts to Earth, and they went to see what happened with Vegeta, but actually found out that everyone's going to Namek, which is why they followed them here. Right now, there's only a few different ships here, but regardless, this means Namek is now under siege because of them, and they know they need to stop it, also feeling bad because they led everyone here. The group begins by splitting up. Vegeta goes with the humans, Salad goes with Piccolo, and Goku goes with Gohan. Three groups should make it easier to find the Dragon Balls, but if they encounter any Frieza Force members, they could easily defeat them as well in groups. Everyone is easily able to wipe out these soldiers after all. I mean, think about how strong they are compared to everyone here. They're really weak, so it's not really too much of an issue. Even the Namekians are joining in to help. I mean, it is their planet after all, and they don't know why these people are here, but everyone explains. And the warrior Namekians are obviously going to fight for their planet, joining these other people. They accidentally started a rebellion against the Frieza Force, and Vegeta is loving every second of it. This is amazing, it's exactly what he's wanted all this time, and maybe they can finally cause the downfall of Frieza, even if it's inadvertently happening. The group does feel bad though as I mentioned before, they think they led Frieza's army to this planet. Vegeta mentions this to one of the Namekians as they're fighting with Doria, and it's good because Doria retorts by saying they were actually spying on everyone, they were going to come to this planet regardless. Frieza's known about the Wish Hopes for a while even if they were just a rumor at that point, and he has had his eye on this planet for a while. If it's any consolation, he tells Vegeta they would have attacked this planet anyways. Vegeta and his pals just caused them to come here earlier. But Zarbon tells him it doesn't matter. They're gonna die regardless. Whether or not they came here now or later, it doesn't matter. Too bad for him though, because right after he finishes this sentence, Vegeta one-shots both of them. So much for all that bravado. A lot of Frieza's crew is getting wiped out. There's only a couple people left. The Ginyu Force who aren't here yet, and Frieza himself. With all these developments, of course Frieza's gonna decide to send the Ginyu Force in. But there is an issue with that. While there are people that would love to fight strong fighters like this, two of those people are Piccolo and Salad. And even though Salad does have some say in DNA with him, those two are a lot more methodical. They see these space pods arriving and decide maybe it's best to destroy them before they even get onto the planet. Yeah, it would be a challenging fight, but why go through that effort? They could just kill them now. The two sent a couple blasts into space, and before the Ginyu Force even gets into the atmosphere, their ships were blown up, leaving them to die a cruel death in the vacuum of space. Kinda messed up, but you know what, it was a smart move and they wouldn't have to deal with any of their weird gimmicks. And this is the tipping point for Frieza, he was already pissed but this just makes him even more angry. They're wiping out his whole army with no casualties on their side, and they just killed the Ginyu Force with a dirty trick, not even waiting for them to arrive. I mean, it was a smart move, but still, it was dirty. He'll fight them if he needs to then. And his first targets will be the people that killed the Ginyu Force, Salad and Piccolo. He arrives on the planet, looking around to see where they are. 
The rest of the group senses this too. With Frieza's huge power, they know he's here. Goku's group, Vegeta's group, and all the Namekians decide to head over there, giving Piccolo and Salad some support. Vegeta's amazed. This may actually work. They destroyed all of Frieza's army, and the only person left is him. King Cold is somewhere out in space, and it seems like he may arrive sometime soon, but as for now, they could just defeat Frieza. He's still unsure, but they might actually be able to pull it off somehow. Hopefully, things end up well for them. Frieza can tell he's going to have some fun. His scouter's going haywire. Everywhere he detects power levels, there's dozens of people fighting against him. Namekians, Earthlings, even Saiyans. But even though he's way outnumbered, he doesn't feel that he's outmatched. His pure strength should be more than enough. Not to mention, his anger's going to help guide him. Before encountering Frieza, it's important that the group gets back to full health. They're not sure if they want to use their Senju beans just yet, but luckily they don't have to. Obviously, there's a lot of Namekians able to heal. And guess where they are? Planet Namek. So they have a lot of them in abundance. Everyone's able to get healed. Obviously, the humans in Piccolo won't grow stronger from being healed, but as for the Saiyans and for Salad, they actually will be. After fighting all these people, they are a bit worn out and a bit injured. So they're not going to get a massive boost in power, but it's still going to be noticeable considering how long they've been fighting and how aggressively. Let's do another brief coverage. Salad would be at 300k, Goku would be at 280k, Vegeta would be at 250k, and Gohan would be at 150k. Really great boost for all of them, especially someone like Gohan who was one of the weakest in the group before. Salad's got a great boost too, even stronger than he was before. Goku's also closing the gap between him and Salad. Even though he hasn't really known Salad for too long, the two of them have a really nice rivalry now. The time spent on the ship was enough to cement that, and the two are having fun keeping this up. And Goku technically is the stronger one here because he has Kaioken. His base is weaker than Salad, but once he actually goes into Kaioken, he'll be a lot stronger. Vegeta's also proud of himself too. He is catching up to Goku after all, trying to get ahead of him like he once was. But that's not the important thing right now. The main thing is that they need to defeat Frieza. They're amazed at their new strength and they hope this will help, but they're still not too sure. They fly over to where Piccolo and Salad are, finding other Namekians along the way. The Namekians were the first to arrive, at least some of them. They're willing to do anything to defend this planet. They'll die if they need to. They can always repopulate. It's easy, and it's important to defeat Frieza and preserve this planet and the universe. Frieza threatens everyone, not just Namek after all. And even if they may die in a struggle against him, it'll be worth it. The warriors are ready to put their lives down, just like the Earthlings are. But more importantly, they have a better strategy. Why not fuse into one strong warrior? Making the ultimate Namekian fighter. If they all fuse together, they'll have a better shot against Frieza, creating a fighter with strength unlike any other. And they have the perfect vessel right there, Piccolo. He's the strongest Namekian, and if other Namekians fuse into him, they think they'll stand a chance against Frieza. Even with the humans being stronger, and with the Saiyans getting another great power boost, they want to be entirely sure that they can defeat Frieza. But then Piccolo brings up an interesting point. He completely forgot. Wait, if they could fuse into him, they could also fuse into Salad too. He is part Namekian after all. The Namekians are surprised to hear this. They knew he was a bio-android, but part Namekian? Interesting. With this DNA in him, he may be able to fuse. I mean, Piccolo seems him use other Namekian techniques, regeneration, being able to stretch his limbs, whatever. Not to mention with Salad's amazing potential, he could probably get a huge boost in power from Namekian fusion. Not to mention he is the strongest of the group right now, disregarding Goku who has Kaido Ken. Piccolo would fuse into him, but if they did that, they'd lose Kami and the Dragon Balls on Earth. If anything, he should wait to reunite with Kami once he goes back there. It's better to have two warriors than one anyways. So he's not going to fuse into Salad. Instead, the Namekians decide they're going to split up, each of them fusing into Piccolo and into Salad. They first start with Piccolo, and he sees an amazing boost in power. Namekians keep fusing into each other, and then into Piccolo, and he can't even comprehend the strength that he's feeling. All these warriors within him, they're granting him power and strength unlike any other. It just makes him even more confident. Salad sees this and he's getting kind of nervous. The Namekians are giving up their lives, and he's not even sure if it'll work, but it's at least worth a shot. Piccolo assures him that it's okay, and he should go ahead with it. And reluctantly, Salad agrees. Some of the Namekians fuse into each other, and then fusing into Salad. Frieza is getting closer and closer, and then he senses something on a scouter, a huge power level nearby. Hold on, this can't be right. It's a couple million and it's rising. And that's not all. There's another power right next to that one. That power of one million is Piccolo's, and right next to that is his student Salad, who has a power that's continuously increasing. But something's changing. Piccolo notices. Salad isn't just growing stronger. He's starting to morph into something else. He begins glowing. Wait, is he transforming? Then Piccolo realizes, this must be it. Inadvertently, through Namekian fusion, they may have helped him get closer towards perfection. He's not entirely sure that this will bring him right towards that, but he knows for sure that this will be a step up. Frieza continues flying over, 
and just as he's about to land, his scouter explodes. A brilliant flash of light covers the area. Everyone else sees it too as they're flying over. The bright light that Frieza saw disappears. He continues flying over, wondering what he just witnessed. His scouter went off the charts before exploding. Whatever power he sensed, it was in the six digits. No, seven digits, maybe even eight. He wasn't sure. The thing blew up before he could even get a good reading. It must be broken. I mean, it did explode after all. There's no way they actually have someone that strong fighting for them, right? But even if they do, it doesn't matter. Frieza has a lot of power in reserve. And if he needs, he will transform. And if he transforms, it'll be over for good. He doesn't have anything to worry about. Well, he hopes so. The Namekians finish merging with Salad, and Piccolo watches on in awe. First off, Piccolo is way stronger than he would have ever expected. It's incredible, his own power is something that he couldn't even imagine. He didn't know this type of strength was possible, but even more impressive is Salad. Not only did his power massively increase, but something else changed about him. It's like something within his android biology activated. Just like they theorized, he actually was able to transform. As a bio-android that's based on getting power from others, he can evolve with enough power and data obtained. And this mass merging actually gave him that. They never really expected something like this, but the transformation is very subtle. This definitely isn't his perfect form, but it does serve as a definite step towards that perfect form. He still looks similar to how he did before. His appearance only slightly changed. He did grow in size and looks older somehow. And his armor slightly morphs from what it looked like before. He's just as surprised as Piccolo. He wasn't aware that this would make him transform of all things. Hell, he didn't even really know that Namekian fusion existed until recently, but it inadvertently served as a way for him to transform. Now permanently in his second form, at least until he gets to the next step. And the fusion finishes just in time, because right after this, Frieza lands in front of the two of them. Wait, was this the power he was sensing? It's just a single Namekian and some purple dude. He's never seen someone like that purple guy before, not knowing what kind of alien race he is. But a Namekian? Why is he so strong of all people? Eh, Frieza doesn't care. Regardless, he'll kill both of them. And it shouldn't be too hard. He starts off by aiming a finger at Piccolo. Quickly, he charges a death beam, hitting him head on. The beam makes contact with Piccolo's chest. And it does absolutely nothing. It just bounces off and dissipates. Interesting. Frieza launches more and more. As Piccolo moves towards Frieza, dodging all the beams. Landing a powerful kick right under his chin. He sees now. He underestimated this Namekian. His scouter must have been right. Piccolo immediately begins fighting Frieza, knowing how big of a threat he is and that he must eliminate him right now. He gets a few good hits in and actually injures Frieza a bit. And Frieza knows he can't hold back as much anymore. He's gonna have to transform at least to his third form. He jumps right past the second form, going into this one. It looks terrifying, and in terms of power, it's way stronger. But still, the two of them aren't really phased. Piccolo tries to attack and learns that Frieza's a lot more durable now. But still not immune to Piccolo's power. And even better, Salad is still there. The two of them team up attacking Frieza 2v1, and during this team up, Salad actually gets a great idea. He sticks out his tail, stabbing Frieza in the side, catching him off guard. Frieza shrieks as his power is absorbed from him, creating a death saucer in his hand and slicing off Salad's tail. But it's too late, Salad already took a good chunk of energy, not to mention all of that data on Frieza that he gets from absorbing him. Oh, and as for his tail, he just regenerates that. And Frieza comes to realize that these guys must be really annoying to fight, he's gonna have to go all out. They're both powerful and can regenerate, and as far as he knows, that guy Salad must have copied his moves somehow because now he's fighting him perfectly, using a lot of his techniques. Salad prepares to finish it off with a death beam, but as he launches the beam, Frieza powers up and begins transforming. The act of him powering up alone actually destroys the beam, with Frieza then completing his transformation, and just as he does, the rest of the group finally arrives. Surprised at what they see, they see someone that they think is Frieza. It looks like him, but he's different somehow. Obviously some of the group hasn't seen him yet, but Vegeta, he doesn't recognize Frieza. He wasn't aware he could transform to this level. But also they see Salad, he transformed too, and they could sense Piccolo's energy. He's so much stronger than before, they wonder what happened. But Piccolo says they'll explain later, right now they need to defeat Frieza. But the group feels kind of unsure about it, of course they're not going to back down, but still. Frieza is so strong now, that even with Salad and Piccolo's power up, they're not sure how they'll be able to accomplish that. But there's actually a couple good things working for them. For one, Piccolo did deal some damage to Frieza while he was in his first form, and that doesn't just go away from him transforming, he's going to retain that damage. Not to mention, Salad stole a lot of his energy when he was in his third form. So even though Frieza's in his final form, he's still pretty injured. And even if he powers up into his buff 100% form, he's not really going to be at 100%, more like 50%. Their effective fighting strategies have actually weakened him by half, and as you can assume that's very helpful. Not to mention Goku's there now, and by utilizing Kaioken, it helps even the fight even more. Goku also doesn't want to use a spirit bomb, but he needs a distraction for that. 
and Gohan actually has a really good idea. He decides to retreat from the fight, going to gather the Dragon Balls in order to summon Paronga. Not only will this allow him to get the wishes, but it'll distract Frieza, allowing Goku some time to charge the spirit bomb. Gohan slips away from the group as they hold Frieza off. And angered, Frieza asks how this is possible, who are these people, and why is Vegeta with them? Vegeta does the honors in introducing them. That guy in the orange suit, Kakarot, he's another Saiyan. The purple guy, an android, genetically engineered to be the perfect warrior. And Piccolo, according to what he said, he's a fusion of Namekians now, the strongest of the race at the moment. And those two baldies, um, they're, they're earthlings, he thinks. He doesn't, he doesn't really know, they don't really look too normal. I mean, one guy doesn't have a nose and the other guy has three eyes. But whatever, he doesn't want to ruin his cool moment. And he doesn't need to unnecessarily bully to chin on Krillin. But Vegeta tells Frieza one thing that he needs to know. They're here to defeat him. Goku butts in and says they're actually here for the Dragon Balls, but and Vegeta turns around and yells at him, don't ruin the moment. He had a really cool speech going on there. Goku apologizes and the fight continues. And Frieza begins to notice, Goku's not actually fighting that much. It's mostly Piccolo, Salad, and Vegeta doing it, with Krillin and Tenshin on lending support. And then Frieza realizes, wait, one of the people's missing. There was another fighter before, it was some kid or something. His eyes start scanning the area, but he, he can't find anyone. Wait, where did he go? They're planning something, aren't they? And suddenly, the sky turns black. Frieza doesn't know what's going on, but then in the distance he sees a giant dragon. And he's pissed. He knows exactly what happened. That kid slipped away to get the Dragon Balls and summon the dragon. He's going to steal the wish. In his rage, Frieza begins rocketing off. But before he can even leave, he's then shot out of the sky by two Makanko Sapos. A simultaneous attack from Piccolo and Salad. Frustrated, he powers up, going into his full power mode. He jumps back up and is about to fly off. But before he does, he looks up and sees something behind Piccolo and Salad. With the area now completely dark from the clouds, he notices a weird blue glow. His eyes trail upwards and he sees. He shoots a laser at it, not knowing what it is. But the laser does nothing. He shoots more and more, and then suddenly is thrown towards him. Goku flings his hands forward, launching the spirit bomb. Freeze is confident that he can take it on, and begins trying to push it back. But as he pushes, it starts hurting him. He feels pain. This attack's actually too strong for him. But he maintains his demeanor. He says that it's nothing. He can push it back. He can counter this. But as he tries to, he's then hit by attacks from below. The other five fighters keep attacking him. And this is not only enough to injure Frieza, but also throw him off guard. Allowing the spear bomb to get closer and closer to actually killing him. Goku gives it one last push, and the rest of the group continues attacking Frieza together. And they suddenly feel a huge burst in power. Little do they know, Gohan actually had a third wish. He had to use two of them to revive Chaozu and Yamcha, obviously. But that third one he didn't want to go to waste. He asks Paronga to heal all the fighters, and this gives them just enough power, just the amount that they need. The spirit bomb finally swallows Frieza whole, causing a massive explosion that illuminates the area. And as the blast dissipates, the cloud is due too. The dragon is gone. Gohan has made the wishes. And the spirit bomb actually did the trick. They had enough people fighting Frieza and enough power to actually overwhelm him. They can't believe it. They defeated him and won. They got their wishes, and Namek is saved. Well, kinda. I mean, Namek has some pretty bad damage. And most of the warrior Namekians are fused into Piccolo and Salad, but, well, the planet's safe. But whatever, they don't care. They can just repopulate with eggs. They're just glad everything's okay now. Well, seems like they accomplished their mission, and now they could finally head back home. So, what would happen following this? Well, on their way home, they would continue their training, and do the same when they actually get back. Salad's actually the strongest in the group now. His Namekian fusion and his second form gave him a huge boost in power. He can tell he's getting closer and closer to the power that he needs to reach his perfection. He's obviously not quite there yet, but he's on the path to get it. He's glad that he's making progress, as is Piccolo. It seems the students finally surpassed the master. But one of the most interesting things is that he gained the powers of Frieza, getting a lot more insight into who Frieza was. He had his drones going around Namek the whole time too in the fight. They helped him get a bit stronger and learn some new techniques. Not to mention he has all the techniques of the Namekians that fuse within him. It's weird though, he and Piccolo could still feel their presence. Even though they have no control of the body, they feel the Namekians watching over them somehow. The Namekians will stick with the two of them forever, and they'll make sure that the Namekian sacrifice wasn't in vain. And now, Yamcha and Chaozu are back, and they've actually learned some things from King Kai. Just like Goku, they now have Kaioken and the Spirit Bomb. And they actually kinda wanna go back to King Kai's, well, without the dying part, but maybe Kami could pull some strings and get them back there to train, and they could bring the other humans along too. They're pretty hyped up, and this serves as a great motivation for them. Yamcha's actually surpassed the other two humans, not only in terms of his base strength, but with the fact that he also has Kaioken. Too bad for Tenshin and Krillin though, and Shoutsu I guess, but he never really expected to surpass them. But that pretty much wraps this arc up, and now we can go into whatever's next. There's a little period of peacetime right now, 
Obviously, Goku's still going to be training, as is everyone else. But it's not like they're training for a deathmatch or something. They're just training for fun and to get stronger. One day, Goku is at home training with Gohan outside. They wonder if there's a way to surpass their limits somehow. Salad was able to transform, and even Frieza was too. They wonder if it's possible for Saiyans to transform. Not just power boosting techniques at Kyo Ken, like an actual full blown transformation. Vegeta mentioned something about a Super Saiyan or whatever. They don't know what it is or how to get it, but they're aiming for whatever that is. It's just trial and error at this point. They're just hoping to stumble upon it by chance. During their sparring match, Goku sees something fly out of the woods. He launches a small blast at Gohan that knocks him away and knocks himself out, quickly allowing them to get out of the way of whatever flew out of the force. The object hits a nearby hill and explodes. It was a key blast. Someone launched a key blast at them, and just as Goku realizes this, he looks back at the force and sees more coming towards him. He and Gohan dodge them all, but they seem to be more so aimed at Goku than anything, and they're powerful key blasts too. It seems like their intent is to actually injure Goku. This isn't some training thing. I mean, what else would it really be? They're just random blasts flying out of the forest. But from the tree line, someone jumps up. Flipping around in the skies, they launch more key blasts at the two of them, then descending downward with a kick. Goku quickly launches a Kamehameha at whatever's flying towards him, and the person simply kicks himself off the Kamehameha, gracefully landing on the ground nearby. It takes Goku a bit to recognize who it is, but he can tell immediately by the outfit and the hair. He remembers this person! It was that assassin from his childhood, Tao! He was at the 23rd World Tournament as well, but they don't remember him being this strong after turning into a cyborg. Gohan doesn't know who this is, but he's on guard, ready to fight alongside Goku. Tao exchanges no words, lunging at them without saying anything. The two fight him, and he's actually really strong. Goku's surprised. What happened? He wasn't this strong against Senshinhan. It doesn't make sense for him to get this powerful. And even with the two of them facing him at once, they're only just able to hold him off. They're struggling to defeat him. And what's even crazier, it seems like he's not even tiring out at all. He's fighting at 100% the whole time. Tao lands a kick that hits Goku, knocking him back into Gohan as the two are thrown into the river nearby. Quickly, Tao sticks his cybernetic arm out, charging a blast. But before he can launch the blast, he senses something nearby. He tries to move his arm out of the way, but it's too late. It gets grazed by a death saucer, breaking the cannon within it. Salad then jumps out. He sensed this fight going on and knew that they needed help. Goku and Gohan are glad to see him here, but they wonder where the other fighters are. Wouldn't they have sensed this too and tried to help? But Salad's not even focused on that. Salad knows who this is. He has data on Tao after all, but he shouldn't be this strong. Sal puts two and two together and realizes that he must be working with Jiro, and must have been upgraded somehow to be an actual android. But Tao realizes he's outmatched, so he retreats, hoping that a grenade doesn't blow up in his face again, but also retreating with the intention that the group follows him. He's going to lead them to a trap, but luckily Sal tells him to stop. He doesn't want them to follow Tao. It might be too dangerous. Besides, they have to help Vegeta and Piccolo. Goku and Gohan were so busy that they didn't even notice. Piccolo and Vegeta are fighting someone, but they can't sense their energy. The three of them fly over, wondering what's happening. Not too far away, Piccolo and Vegeta are engaged in their own fight, and they're losing pretty badly. The two people in front of them seem to also be from the Red Ribbon Army, and they don't have any sort of key at all that they could sense. But one thing they know for sure is that these two are strong. They've witnessed it firsthand. They can't even damage these two, and their attacks are so powerful that they can barely defend against them. These two are androids 14 and 15. The two of them charge an attack together, ready to finish off Vegeta and Piccolo. But in the nick of time, the other three fighters arrive, deflecting the blast back at the androids. They're uninjured, though. But weirdly enough, they also retreat. Salad realizes that this is definitely a trap of some sorts. Why would they retreat right now? Suspiciously, he looks around, trying to see if Jiro's anywhere. He can't find him, but he knows Jiro's watching. And sure enough, he is. On a mountaintop nearby, he's looking down on the group. With cybernetic upgrades of his own, although not too advanced since he was more focused on the other androids. By his side is another project of his, Android 13. The ultimate most powerful android in his arsenal. Good. Everything is falling into place. Soon enough, the androids will have led everyone into a trap, being able to kill Goku and eliminate Salad as well. But as Jiro watches on, his grin turns into a grimace. He makes direct eye contact with Salad, who returns an equally threatening death stare. Jiro scoffs as he and 13 retreat, disappearing from sight before the group even notices them. So, this is Jiro's plan. He's going to finally try and kill Goku, as well as Salad himself. Salad tells the group to follow him. They're going to go to Jiro's lab and see if they can find some clues about the androids. Maybe they could either find them there, or find blueprints that actually cover them. But either way, Salad has a bad feeling about this. He doesn't know what to expect at all. Salad knows that something's pretty fishy right now. Besides the fact that all the androids just retreated, he clearly just saw Jiro. He doesn't know what they expect him to do. Maybe they expect them to follow the other androids. Maybe it was part of their plan to be spotted. Who knows? But it seems like it might be the time for a diversion. 
With one finger, Silent points a blast at the water nearby, dragging it along the water, creating a massive wave. He then throws on a bunch of key blasts too, creating smoke around the area. He's not sure if Jiro's watching and how many androids are with him, but what he's trying to accomplish right now is to make sure that they're not spotted retreating. Of course, it looks like the androids retreated, but for all they know, they're still out there, absorbing not only Salad's moves, but everyone else. They all follow Salad as they're led to some random place in the woods, and eventually they stumble upon Dr. Jiro's lab. Salad wasn't too sure where else to go, but in terms of trying to figure out what's going on, this seems to be their best bet. And thankfully, it is empty, but Salad expects the androids to show up soon. Maybe they know that the group went here. Maybe they're at Capsule Corp. Maybe they're at Kame House. He's not sure, but he expects that there's probably a trap laid somewhere. So they need to move quick. In the lab, everyone begins picking up random blueprints that they find, whatever they could find lying around, and Salad begins analyzing all of them. They also find a bunch of random android pods, labeled from numbers 13 to number 18, with 13, 14, and 15 being empty. And from what Salad can gather from the blueprints, it seems that Jerome made a series of androids, although androids 16, 17, and 18 were deemed failures, and they've been left dormant, which is why they're still in their pods. The group considers destroying these ones, but Salad says he could try to reverse engineer them, either to make them good, or to figure out a weakness that he could use to exploit the other androids. But it's obviously going to take some time, so they leave those ones intact, while trying to study the blueprints for the other ones. As the group leaves, they do find one more interesting thing in the plants, something that Salad picks up right away. It notes some project labeled as Cell. Salad searched everywhere in the lab, but doesn't find this project laying about. Jiro has the project in mind, and it seems he was still unsure about whether or not he wanted to pursue it, and Salad could clearly see why he hasn't pursued it yet. It seems pretty much similar to him, almost an exact copy of him, if anything. A fighter comprised of the DNA of other fighters, a bioengineer to be the perfect being. This must be Jiro's answer to Salad, another version of him. The group exits the lab, and just as they expected, they're immediately attacked. Blasts rain down from the sky, and Salad quickly creates a barrier, with the others trying to do the same as well. And amidst all the chaos, Chaotu and Yamcha retreat with all the android pods, leaving the others behind to fight. They did want to test Kaioken, so it's kind of a bummer that they are the ones that have to drag these pods away, but maybe later on they'll get some action. It would be really fun to use Kaioken against the androids. Of course, they aren't the only ones with it, and you'll see what I mean later. But still, they kind of want to join. As all the blasts clear away, the androids see a bunch of barriers below, and three of them descend from the sky, the same ones from before, Tau, 14, and 15. Salad asks where Jiro is, as well as the other android, which he assumes is 13. 14 says not to worry about with 15 saying that they're the main course right now. 13 is much stronger than them anyways. So if these two can't be defeated, they have no chance of fighting 13. Not to mention, they have Tao with them, who may actually be more of an issue. The groups begin fighting, and it immediately becomes clear that they have the advantage over 14 and 15, but Tao is actually able to handle himself pretty well. Goku even comments on it. It seems this cyborg upgrade is really helping him. But amidst the fight, they then hear two people shout Kao Ken, catching the androids off guard, as 14 is then attacked by two other fighters. Yamcha and Chanto have returned, and they're finally able to use Kao Ken in battle, injuring 14 as the rest of the fighters finish him off. With 14 left in pieces, they then set their attention on 15, and with the team effort, they take him out as well. Alright, this might not be as bad as they thought. There's two androids down, and only three to go. This only serves to anger Tao further. Not only is he angry to see Goku and his kid, but the fact that they're even losing. But he shouldn't lose faith. They still have him, as well as 13 and Jiro. Tao begins fighting more seriously. His power is much higher, and his techniques are much better, and despite being outnumbered, he's still managing pretty well. This leads to a rematch of sorts between Tenshinhan, Goku, and Tao, and they've paced themselves long enough, they can let out more of their full power. The two of them begin powering up more and more, and they start seeing an advantage over Tao. He's not the only one who's improved over this time period, and the funny part is, they did it all naturally, he had to get upgrades to do so. He can't believe he's being overpowered by them, and just when they're about to finish the fight, they launch a blast at Tao. Although, it's blocked by someone. Jiro quickly entered the battlefield, not only jumping in front of Tao to protect him, but to absorb the energy blast and get stronger himself. They finally coaxed him into fighting. But it's not just Jiro that jumps in now. 13 also lands on the battlefield. And even with two androids defeated, they still seem very confident. And Salad gets a pretty bad feeling about this. Seeing Jiro, he immediately sets his sights on the Doctor, tackling him and grabbing him as they're launched far away. They land in the woods nearby, as the showdown between creator and creation begins. Jiro clearly isn't that strong, at least not even as strong as the other androids. It's very obvious that he's outmatched here. Sure, he's able to absorb Key Blast, but in terms of raw physical strength, it's nothing amazing. But that's not the point here. Salad knows that Jiro wasn't a threat physically. It's more so whatever he had planned, and the fact that Salad wanted to settle this one-on-one. -on -one. It's not like he has anything to prove, though. He just wants Jiro out of his life. Jiro tells Salad that he was supposed to be the ultimate creation of his, but calls him an utter failure. 
Had he been loyal, things would have been so much better. He could have been stronger. He could have been perfect. And none of this conflict would have ever happened. They would have just dealt with Goku, and that would have been that. But Sal doesn't care what Jiro has to say. He's completely unfazed by Jiro's words. He's made himself a better fighter than Jiro ever could have. All of his own training and experiences. Sure, he's not perfect, but he's on the path to becoming perfect. One day he'll be there. He'll obtain his final form and grow stronger from there on out. And the best part is, he's free to do what he wants. He's not a slave to Jiro's will. Jiro says it doesn't matter. Even if he's defeated, the group doesn't stand a chance against his newest creation, his ultimate android, Super Android 13. With a single swipe, he bisects Dr. Jiro, taking both arms off in the swing. And with Jiro literally disarmed now, Salad launches a blast that completely destroys the Doctor. It'll be interesting to see how 13's gonna act without a commander. And if anything, this helps reinvigorate Salad, the main source of his anxiety, everything that he was worrying about. He finally got rid of it. And the threats that he's facing right now, he's not worrying when they're about to appear. They're already here. He just has to manage them. He flies back over to the group, witnessing an encounter with 13. 13 and Tao have teamed up, and it seems that 13 is surprisingly powerful. The two of them together are actually enough to overwhelm the group. 13 is pretty strong, clearly much more powerful than the other androids. Salad continues wondering, is this what Jerome meant when he said Super Android 13? Or was that implying something else? That maybe he can go beyond where he is now? Obviously, Jerome is capable of making androids that could transform. I mean, look at Salad. As the group continues working together, they're eventually able to overpower the two androids. Just barely, though, and it seems that this battle might be over. Cyborg Tau is on his last legs, and as for Android 13, he still seems relatively okay. But they have one last trick up their sleeve, something that Android 13 was saving just in case. Near the destroyed remains of Androids 14 and 15, some of the scattered pieces of them begin vibrating. The parts fly over to Android 13, some go into his head, and some go into his chest, and it seems they assimilate with him somehow. They're not sure what's happening, but they can tell it's not good. And Tao watches on, smiling and laughing. Surely now the group will meet their demise. And he continues laughing as his fellow Android begins transforming. 13 bulks up. His skin begins turning blue. His hair becomes orange and spiked up. The transformation completes, and Salad finally sees what Jiro was talking about. This is what he must have meant. Super Android 13 was a transformation, a merging of the three androids. All the fighters gang up on him, and desperate attempt to try and defeat the android. But clearly they're too late. They had their chance with regular Android 13, but with him transforming, they're completely outclassed now. 13 scans all the fighters once more, communicating with the supercomputer. He could tell how far ahead he is of them, not to mention, he could predict how they're gonna fight. And then he notices something interesting. Salad's doing the same thing. Ah, of course. He should have expected a fellow android to be just as smart as him. And quickly, he shoots down all of Salad's drones. Of course, Salad could build more later, but right now he won't have them to support him in battle. They're providing so much data about 13. But in terms of this new form, he's going to be completely left in the dark. The Saiyans go into attack, with Piccolo telling Salad to join them. Even though the group does outnumber Android 13, there's too many of them to fight at once. Especially considering the fact that Android 13 is so much stronger than all of them, possibly even combined. Of course, this ends up causing the Kaioken users to actually have to use Kaioken. But that doesn't even help too much. Even with people like Goku that are incredibly strong, especially with Kaioken on top of it, it's not doing too much to help. And of course, it just gives 13 more and more data, which only adds to how formidable of a foe he is. And 13's not even the only one they're facing. Even though he is kind of injured, Tao is there too. And granted, he's not as powerful as 13, and not nearly as tough to take on. But with 13 there, Tao works as an excellent distraction because if anyone tries to attack him, it leaves them open for Android 13. 13 begins charging up a bunch of energy, surrounded by a red dome of it, as it then explodes outwards, knocking all the fighters back and leveling the entire area, including the mountains around them and the lab. The mountain range and forest is turned into a desolate wasteland, as the fighters dig themselves out of the rubble, ready to fight once more. But they're running out of energy, the use of Kaioken is wearing out the fighters that can use it, and even though Salad and Piccolo can regenerate, it's not like they can infinitely keep fighting. They hear all the Namekians inside of them trying to communicate, warning of the threat that they're facing. The Namekians try to guide Piccolo, and as for Salad, they know he's an odd case, and give him an idea. Salad has something he could use, he doesn't know if it'll actually work, but it might pay off. Goku, Gohan, and Vegeta are trying to take on 13 right now, and Piccolo watches as Salad then jumps in, now surrounded by a red glow. Wait, he has Kaioken? Yeah, he actually did have it, but he was trying to save it because he didn't know if he'd pull it off. With all the research he's done on everyone, as well as the fact that he has updated DNA from Goku and all, he's always had access to this, but he saw how painful it was for the others to use and decided against it. Not to mention, he didn't know how it would interact with his body. It's one thing with the humans and Saiyans, but with him, he was kind of unsure. The good thing is he can regenerate while using it, although he's not using it at very high levels right now. At most, he'd probably be able to push it to times four. 
but because of how little practice he has with it, it's incredibly draining. But still, even with this additional power, it seems like it's not enough. There seems to be no way for them to actually defeat Android 13. Is this really it? It seems everything's gonna end here. Fighters are picked off one by one, left heavily injured or unconscious. The only fighters barely standing are Goku, Piccolo, and Sally. But even then, they're on their last legs. But out from nearby rubble, Gohan jumps out, displaying one of his rage boosts. He actually does land some hits on Android 13, surprising the android. He didn't have data on any of this. He knew Gohan was prone to rage boost, but he didn't know he can get this powerful from it. Although, of course, this rage boost is fleeting. And as Gohan continues punching and kicking the android, he grabs Gohan midair. He lifts up another hand and charges a point-blank blast. The others watch on in fear, thinking he'll actually kill Gohan. But quickly, Salix sends one of his arms out, grabbing onto 13's other arm, redirecting the blast. Gohan then has one last burst of energy, kicking Android 13's arm and breaking it, freeing himself. And now Android 13's even more pissed. With his one non-broken arm, he launches an attack at Gohan, leaving behind a massive crater and a heavily injured Gohan. 13 then slowly walks over to Salad and Goku. They should have expected this. The androids are superior after all, and it's a shame that Salad wasn't there to join them. But all that matters is in the end, Jiro was able to win. Tao weakly stands up, brushing himself off, and asks 13 if he will let him do the honors. He sticks out a blade towards Goku, ready to finish the job, but then decides maybe it would be best to give Goku a little show first. With his cannon arm, he begins charging a blast, directed right at Gohan. Before Goku dies, Tao wants to make sure he watches everyone else die around him too. Tao turns over to Gohan, launching the blast, and a flash of light warps around him. The blast makes impact and explodes, and Tao turns back to Goku, only to see that he's not there. Wait, what? Salad and Piccolo are just as confused. That flash of light that warped around Tao, it couldn't be. And as the blast dissipates, they see Goku standing over there, although something's different about him. They can't see it first because he's coated by a golden aura, but the aura eventually clears out, revealing Goku there with blonde hair. Everyone's eyes widen, especially the weakened Vegeta nearby. That's it, Kakarot's done it. There's no doubt about it, he's become a Super Saiyan. And Goku doesn't waste this opportunity, not even knowing what power he possesses right now. Quickly, he dashes over to Android 13, too fast for him to even process what's happening. The supercomputer has no data on this, and it doesn't seem like he's going to get any data anytime soon. And with the little energy he has remaining, Goku launches one attack and makes it count, completely destroying the android, only to collapse right after. Tao panics after seeing this, and he tries to escape now. He quickly tries to leave the area, only to be hit by a blast. Ten Shinhan, with the last of his energy, launches a Kikoho, finishing the job and killing Tao. Everyone's bloodied and beaten, but they're victorious. And after some time, they're all healed. But Salad uses this opportunity to try and make himself stronger. So that form Goku had was interesting. He wants to see if he could study it at all, learning from it and seeing if he can apply it to himself somehow. But more importantly, he's studying the blueprints of the other androids, as well as whatever pieces of them he found scattered around. The main thing he wants is what Tao had, infinite energy. But also he wanted to see what made Android 13 so powerful, how he was able to merge with the other androids, and seeing if he's capable of anything similar. With the pieces that he's gathered, Salad begins studying them, not sure what each of them do and where they're from. He's surprised he even found any of these random robot parts scattered around. But as he continues studying them, something weird begins happening. It's kind of like he saw before in the battlefield. The parts, they begin vibrating, and they jump up from the lab around him, colliding with Salad and assimilating within it. He's not sure what just happened, and he doesn't know if it's a good sign or a bad sign. Maybe this is some sort of contingency plan for Dr. Jiro. Salad's unsure of what's happening. And obviously this is cause for concern. He feels odd at first and is worried, but then he feels fine. But the thing that just happened definitely wasn't normal, so he's kind of in panic mode. He needs to get this reverse, and he needs to tell someone about it. Even though he feels fine right now, this could be bad. He tries to fix it quick. Of course, he knows how he's built. With the smarts of both Bulma and Jiro in him, he probably can figure out a way to reverse this. Just to make sure that he's okay. But once he actually attempts to fix this, he then stops suddenly. He gets a different idea. Something within him clicks, and he feels power. The parts begin blending with him more, and he doesn't even realize what's happening. But the power that he's feeling, it isn't enough. He wants more. He still needs to achieve the perfection that he wanted. From the merging, he actually did grow a bit stronger. But something changed in his mind too, and that's why he's feeling the way he does right now. It's not like these parts merging with him will make him loyal to Jiro. He'll never be loyal to him. But he's become a little bit malicious in a way. The influence of 13, 14, and 15 are changing him, as well as the supercomputer that controlled those ones. Thoughts begin rushing through his mind. That desire for his perfect form, he wants it again. And maybe the way to achieve it was around him this entire time. He gets stronger from absorbing power, just like he did just now. The other androids inside are beginning to influence him more and more. There's multiple things that have influenced Salad's power and personality so far. There's so many within him right now. 
Besides Salad himself, there's the Namekians, there's Androids, there's the supercomputer. But those malicious parts, they're starting to overwhelm him, and that original Salad keeps kicking in. The one that Jiro intended him to be. Even though the androids and Jiro have been defeated, it seems that they're still gonna have a resurgence somehow. He's thinking more and more. He needs his power from his friends. That's how he's gonna get it. He can absorb them, get power from them somehow, as well as collecting more and more data. Maybe this is what he needs for his perfect form. He needs the power to actually fuel that ability. But who should be his first target, and how should he go about this? Under the control of the androids, he departs, and begins looking for a suitable target, and he knows just the person to fight first. Someone that's alone, someone secluded that would be easy to attack, and someone that he knows very well in order to counter. He flies away, and in the middle of the wasteland, he meets Piccolo. Piccolo sends him arriving, and he wonders why Salad's here. But there's something weird about him, the look on his face, and his key, it feels different. It's not like Salad even answers him or anything, he just immediately attacks Piccolo. This catches Piccolo off guard. He knew something was up, but he didn't think this was gonna happen. He begins questioning Salad more and more. This isn't like him, what's going on? He doesn't say anything, he just continues attacking. And then Piccolo notices what's going on. Salad's mostly trying to attack with his tail. He's trying to absorb Piccolo's power. Piccolo powers up, grabbing Salad's tail mid-attack, ripping it off. Of course he's gonna regenerate it, but Piccolo uses this to get some distance. Something's not right. And with the timing of all this, he suspects that Dr. Jiro has something to do with it, even beyond the grave. But then he remembers. Those pieces of the androids. He remembers that Salad took some of them to study. He upgraded himself, giving himself an infinite energy energy from Tao. But he was also studying the other androids, and using their pieces, maybe something happened with that. Maybe he tried to test it out or something that he got taken control of. Piccolo doesn't know what's going on. He's just theorizing right now. But he knows whatever's going on, it's bad. Salad's being controlled by something other than him. This is right off the heels of their other fight with the androids. They didn't expect to fight someone else so soon, especially someone in their group. And that's the thing, no one else knows about this yet, just Piccolo. He needs to get the word out there, and they need help especially from one certain person. He needs to get in contact with Bulma. If this is something mechanical, maybe she could reverse it somehow. She does have access to the blueprints from Jiro after all. After the whole androids thing, they're able to collect them, and that's part of what Salad's been studying too. She could probably figure out something, a way to fix this, but it's not going to be that easy. He actually needs to get there first in one piece, and not lead Salad along with him. He needs to stall for time, but he has an idea. He begins communicating mentally with others, trying to warn them of what's going on, and asking for help. Someone needs to get a hold of Bulma. They ask where Piccolo is right now. He's in the midst of the battle, and he could use some help over here too. Krillin and Yamcha respond. They say they'll go to Bulma for help. All the other fighters will go over there and help him. A big issue with this fight too is if Salad does attack them successfully, he'll get stronger, and they can't kill Salad. They're just trying to stop him, do whatever they can to hold him back for now. But Salad expected this anyways. He knew if he attacked one of them, the others would come. He's surprised that Piccolo was able to fend him off. He knew how strong Piccolo was after all, but sadly it's not strong enough. He powers up in the Kaioken. With infinite energy and regeneration, he could use this flawlessly. He goes into times two just to catch Piccolo off guard. It's a direct hit. He stabs Piccolo right in the arm with his tail, beginning to drain his energy. Piccolo's injured by this, feeling weaker and weaker the more it happens. Thankfully in the nick of time, he is able to cut off Salad's tail, but he's very tired out now, and Salad has grown noticeably stronger by taking Piccolo's energy. The good thing is not too long after, his friends arrive to help. They're still confused as to what's going on. Piccolo could only be brief when he was explaining. But Salad tells him to stop looking so confused. Can't they tell what this is? This is what he was meant for. He was built by Jiro to destroy them, to grow stronger, to become perfect. But Goku questions why this is happening. He never was like this. Salad was good, he was different from the other androids. But that's the thing, he is no different from them now. How do they think he got stronger? Who do they think he was studying? Those androids became a part of him, and they're leading him down this path. He'll attain perfection and become the strongest thing in the galaxy. He doesn't care about Jiro's motives or whatever. This is all for him. But Goku notes something interesting to Piccolo. Salad's key definitely is different, and a lot more malicious. But still, Goku feels a bit of his normal key there. Vegeta notes this too. Maybe there's a bit of himself still left in there. Unlike the other androids, he's not purely mechanical. He's an actual living organism. There still has to be some sort of sentience in there. Something not being controlled by a computer. And Piccolo tries paying attention more and more closely. He could feel it. There's still good in there, not just Salad himself, but also the influence of the Namekians. His programming is just being overridden by the other androids. But Goku challenges Salad. He tells him, they defeated the androids once already. It won't be a problem defeating them again, even if it means defeating Salad. Salad brushes this off, immediately going in to attack the group. Meanwhile, let's go over to Bulma's lab. Krillin and Yamcha have filled her in on everything, and she was actually able to work pretty quickly. The best part is, she knew all about this a while ago. When they first found Salad, she always was a bit concerned about him being a red ribbon android and all. And once the other androids were defeated, she found out that a lot of them had some sort of self-destruct buttons. 
Wait, she's gonna blow Salad up? No, 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 not that. This just means there's some sort of back door in the Android's program, something that she could use to get in there. Not necessarily self-destruction. Salad probably doesn't even have a bomb in him. This just proves that Jiro built some sort of safeguard. If all those other androids had it, Salad definitely has to too. And after they raided Jiro's lab, she actually did find out about this. She's been looking into it. Salad himself even noted it. He was more focused on giving himself an upgrade, which he did on his own. But Bulma was fascinated with Jiro's plans. And if the other androids are taking an influence of him, there's a way to stop this. First of all, there might be another supercomputer somewhere. This is what originally controlled the androids and collected all the data for them. But also, there's a way to shut them down. If those three are the ones influencing Salad right now, all they need to do is figure out a way to stop them. It might be a bit hard though. If they're merged with Salad, they're hardwired into it. But that just means they need to give Salad more power somehow. They need to activate his perfection. She figured out a way to finally access it. And this is what they're gonna use to counter the android's influence. If he becomes perfect, that might create an opening for them. While he transforms, they could destroy the androids. Get rid of whatever chips are influencing him. It's a long shot, but it's the only chance they have besides actually killing him. The issue is, it seems he needs to absorb some piece of technology to actually become perfect. She doesn't know why Jiro built his androids like that, but that's the way it is. Luckily, she's able to recreate this, and she thinks that it might work in the form of a weapon. If she creates a sword or something, someone can use it to not only inject the data within him, but also the parts that he needs to become perfect. It shouldn't take too long to make. Meanwhile, the fight's still going. Krillin and Yamcha relay all this information, and even though there's so many people fighting him right now, it's actually a bit tough. After he absorbed Piccolo's energy, and with the androids merging with him, plus the fact that he has infinite energy now, Salad is much stronger than he was before. Of course, with all of them together, they're able to hold him off. But it's just that he's acting so much more sporadically, and he's not fighting like normal. The data of the supercomputer is helping him too. If they were fighting a normal Salad, this would be easy. But he's buffed, he has infinite energy, he has Kaioken, and the supercomputer is giving him so much data and making him fight differently. It's not gonna work. But mid-battle, something happens to him. He freezes. He grabs his head in pain. Something's wrong. He tries to speak. And for a brief moment, his normal self breaks through. He tells the group, the supercomputer shut down. Attack him now while they can. Wait, if the supercomputer's off, that means he should be fine, right? He tells him no, hurry up. Even without the supercomputer, the androids are still in him, influencing him and activating his old program. They're just gonna take some time to reboot. They're concerned. He's acting normal and they don't want to attack him, but he tells them to do it. Eventually, they have no other choice. They decide to attack him while he's off guard. This injures him, and he purposefully doesn't regenerate. He knows they're about to reboot soon, and he wants to give them a fighting chance. He tells them to get Bulma's help. She could help reverse this, and Piccolo says she's already working on it. That's good. He's happy to hear this. But then he flips back to being controlled by the androids. They then hear him speaking in a different voice. It's 13's voice. Even if the supercomputer's down, it doesn't matter. 13's already collected all the data himself, as well as 14 and 15. And with the power and abilities of Salad's body, as well as the power they're absorbing right now, nothing they do will be enough. He has to take some time to regenerate though. Even though Salad just regained control for a bit, 13 promises them that won't happen anymore. As he tries to regenerate, the others attack him. Goku, Piccolo, Vegeta, Gohan, everyone's attacking at once. 13 powers up, activating Kaioken again. This tears his body up even more, and even with regeneration, it's gonna make the regeneration really slow, but it makes him so much faster and stronger. He stretches his arms out, beginning to attack from a distance. At one point, he even grabs Goku, and Goku's able to break free, but then they see something fly past everyone. It's Salad's tail. He stretches it out. It's right behind Goku, and it pierces right through his back. They're able to cut it off, but it's already too late. Thirteen's chuckling. He now has Goku's power. Even if it's only a little bit, this is still going to buff him. He tries to power up more, and suddenly his expression changes, and he quickly dodges something that flies past him. And then another object flies past. Landing on the battlefield is Krillin and Yamcha, with Krillin having a sword in his hand. A sword? Why does he have that? What is that gonna do to him? But then Thirteen remembers. He remembers what Salad was told before. They're getting Bulma to help them. But if these guys are coming from Bulma's place, why do they have a sword? They try to attack again. He's able to dodge quickly. But then Krillin tosses the sword to Piccolo. Piccolo begins swimming, deliberately trying to stab a Salad. And then he sees what's happening. Bulma, of course, knows how the androids work by now. Maybe she figured out a way to shut them down. Obviously, she can't blow them up. There's no bomb inside. The sword isn't any normal sword. If he gets stabbed with it, it'll wire up to him removing his influence and destroying the other androids too. He tells them that's not gonna work. He's already hardwired within his sound, but Krillin says that's not what the sword is for. The sword's passed around more and more between everyone. Thirteen tries to take the sword for himself, losing focus. He needs to amp up Kaioken even more, but if he does so, it's gonna completely halt his regeneration. He'll have to focus all of it on trying to counter Kaioken, but it doesn't matter. He needs the power. This leaves him a bit open defensively, but offensively, it makes him so much more powerful. The group's having a hard time, even with all of them together at once. This isn't gonna work. Thirteen needs to get that weapon. While still in Kaioken, he splits up. 
creating four copies of himself. This divides his power up, but he doesn't even care. At least it gives him a better shot at actually getting the weapon. The clones all descend down, trying to attack everyone at once. Salad, or 13, begins laughing maniacally. They're not gonna win this. Infinite energy, Kaio Ken, more DNA. He has so much power, so much data. And as the clones all fend off each of the fighters individually, one of them ascends up into the sky. He has the perfect idea. If they're gonna be annoying, there's only one way to counter this. He'll destroy the planet and pry the power out of their corpses. He begins charging a massive attack. There's a huge burst in power. Lightning courses throughout the entire area. He tells them it's been fun, but it's time to say goodbye. 13 will keep this body for himself, attain perfection, become so strong that no one in the universe will stop him. They might have shot off the supercomputer, but who cares? He doesn't need that. He doesn't need Earth. He doesn't need Jero or anyone else helping him. The attack is fully charged. He launches it, and the group is entirely helpless to stop him, except for one person. The sword is in Gohan's hands, and Piccolo steals it. He charges all of his key, channeling it into the sword. All of his power is put into this. He won't be able to attack afterwards. He tells everyone, fire at the attack, counter it. The clones of Salad all disappear, going back to the main body. He puts more power into the attack, while everyone else tries to counter it at once. Piccolo continues charging energy into the sword. The blast gets closer and closer to Earth. The entire ground is beginning to tear up, and everyone's stressing as they're trying to counter it. But in the middle of it, Piccolo shouts. The sword is encased by Ki, and it takes on a shape that looks like a spear. Piccolo holds it upwards, and throws it. It cuts right through the attack, not destroying it, but slicing clean through. He hears 13 laughing up above and 13 continues putting more and more power into the attack, but then notices something's parting the attack midway, and it's too late. Before he even has time to react, the sword pierces right through his chest. His eyes then change color, and the attack that he launched completely dissipates, and 13 just freezes up. Within Salad's body, he sees what's going on. That sword, it hardwired itself into Salad's body, and it's doing something weird. Not only is it trying to shut down the androids right now, but it activated something within Salad. While the external struggle ended, an internal one began. The chips for 14 and 15 shut down, and 13's is barely hanging on. He's being overpowered by Salad. It's just like Goku said, they'll defeat them again. 13's circuits are completely overloaded by power, not only being shut down by Bulma's device, but being overwhelmed by Salad. Back in the real world, everyone watches on. It seems calm. Salad's up in the air completely frozen, and then he begins glowing. His key begins shifting. The maliciousness goes away. It seems like his normal self is returning. He descends down into the ground, a little bit uneasy at first. But then he realizes what's happened, that device that Bulma made. It's what he needed. She found out the secret to perfection. Overriding the technology of 13, 14, and 15 made this possible. He knew that researching them was the right idea, even if it did lead to this. He apologized to everyone, realizing this is all his fault, but he's glad everyone's okay. They all watch on as Salad begins to transform. It seems he's going to enter his perfect state. The group watches on as Salad evolves. His power increases dramatically. His perfect form is definitely going to be something incredible. So for this, I went with something a little bit more unique. A lot of you were probably expecting this guy to be in the scenario, but I think it's better if I alter it a bit. Salad's perfect form is revealed, and here's what it looks like. It's weird, for some reason this looks oddly familiar to everyone, but they don't know where they've seen this guy before. Jokes aside, he's finally attained perfection, and has grown a lot stronger as well. I think I also accidentally made him a bit overpowered too. Not only is he perfect, but he has infinite energy as well, due to try and take that from Cyborg Tao. Salad has no idea what to think, and this is definitely going to take some getting used to. Imagine this, infinite energy, Namekian fusion, the power of all its DNA together, and all the data he's gathered so far, especially the stuff he got with his drones. He doesn't know if this is what Jiro envisioned. If anything, this might be completely different, but it's a good kind of different. Obviously, his life has gone way different than what Jiro wanted as well, but he's done it. He's achieved perfection. Although, how strong is he really? Well, he'll just have to find that out later on. So, what's happening next? Well, just to make sure everything's okay, they go and check out Jero's lab, and surely enough, they do find other plans from him. Salad saves all this data and these blueprints for later, and they make sure that whatever Jero has planned won't ever come to fruition. It seems that they're finally free of the Red Ribbon Army. Well, obviously besides Salad, of course. But with how strong Salad is, of course Goku's curious too. He wants to fight him. He wants to see where he can improve. Maybe Salad could help him train more. Salad is part Saiyan, after all. Maybe he could use his scientific research to try and make Saiyan stronger. You know, maybe look and see what caused them to go Super Saiyan. Study it and see if there's a way to make it more efficient, and let them grow faster. He never actually considered that. It's a great idea too. And now we enter the 7 year time skip. Over this time, the Saiyans are training to ascend Super Saiyan, with the help of Salad and Piccolo training with them. And Salad actually does try to do scientific research into Saiyans, trying to figure out what causes Super Saiyan to even happen. He not only is able to discover S-cells, but also is able to figure out a way to make Super Saiyan more efficient. Well, in theory. He looks at how the cells work and he gets this down to a science. Combine that with the great martial arts mind of Goku, 
and there's a pretty good formula for success here. By now, the three Saiyans all have Super Saiyan, and pretty quickly they're actually able to master the form. They're growing at an incredibly rapid pace, even Salad's amazing. He actually doesn't spend too much of his time fighting or training. Instead, he's basically coaching everyone. He wants everyone else to become stronger as well, especially after what happened last time. In case he's not able to fight alongside them, he and Goku want to be sure that everyone else will be able to handle themselves. The Saiyans all continue working with Super Saiyan, and even find a way to ascend it eventually. Goku simply dubs this form Super Saiyan 2, and even though the power of this form is amazing and it takes some time for Vegeta and Gohan to get it too, Goku's already wondering if there's anything else. Maybe there's no limit to what Saiyan could do. Maybe they can go even beyond this. Salad is just as curious, and he says he can help, but Goku says he has the right idea now of where to go. Using all that he learned from Salad, plus his own experience, he feels that he could find this himself. He'd feel more accomplished that way too. But then Salad has a great idea. Maybe they shouldn't just focus on Super Saiyan forms. Saiyans have other forms too. Although there's an issue with this. The one he's thinking of is Grade 8. Maybe they could use that to improve their power somehow. Although, without a tail, this is going to be kind of hard. He continues his research, and eventually has a great idea. Maybe he could recreate whatever transforms them into a great ape, kind of like an artificial moon but different. He actually does test out this idea, but in terms of results, there's not really too much interest in it. It ends up working. He creates a Blutzwave machine with Bulma. He tries it out on Goku, and he does turn into a great ape, but there's not too much impressive about that. It takes so much effort to do this, and it's so much weaker than any of his Super Saiyan forms. Vegeta says it might be kind of useless to train with this, but Goku's actually having a different idea. It might actually work somehow. He has an idea in mind, but it's going to take a lot of time and he's not too sure if it's going to work. They continue training over this time period, and Goku eventually does discover something by himself. Although, it is incredibly dangerous. It involves using a great ape and going Super Saiyan. Vegeta and Gohan are amazed to hear this, but Goku also says that it is dangerous. He hasn't attempted it yet, and he knows that when he does, it's probably going to be very hard to control. He could barely control great ape as is. Imagine combining Super Saiyan with that. Vegeta says he's just going to keep working with Super Saiyan 2. He feels that he could find something beyond that without all this nonsense. Gohan is a bit curious too, but he's also going to stick with Super Saiyan 2 just because he doesn't have the time to do this. So let's fast forward a bit more. A world tournament is coming up, and everyone's getting involved. It'll be a good way to show how everyone's grown so far. But before the tournament begins, Salad and Piccolo notice something. There's some odd people nearby in a crowd. Of course, it's Dragon Ball, there's a lot of weird people in the crowd. I mean, there's like walking, talking dogs. But this is a different kind of weird. They clearly don't blend in at all, and in terms of their energy, it feels ominous. Not in terms of it feeling evil, but just weird. Nothing like they've ever felt before. Almost godly in a sense. And they could tell they're being watched by these two. Salad says he's gonna go check it out, and Piccolo says not to, because just then, Shin begins communicating with them. Telepathically, he's talking to them. Piccolo kind of freaks out from this, surprised to even hear people talking in his head. Well, it's not the first time he has Namekian shoes within him, but still. And Sal is actually intrigued. So these guys are Kai's beyond even what King Kai is at? What are they doing here then? Salad ends up leaving the group for a bit, saying he'll be right back before the tournament begins. Piccolo follows too. The two of them meet Shin and Kabito face to face. And Salad asks them to not hide anymore. They're here for a reason and it's making him concerned. He wants to know what's going on. Kabito says they should just wait to explain. But Shin has an idea. Maybe this will be just enough. Maybe this will be what they need. They can make this go a lot smoother this way. They want to find Bobbidi and stop him before anything bad happens. They tell them about Majin Buu and all. Majin Buu? The more they hear about this guy, the more concerned they get. Right now, they're just having a problem finding Bobbidi. If they could find him, Salad and Piccolo might be enough to stop him and Debora. And this gives Salad an idea. They said he arrived on a spaceship, right? Even if they can't track his key right now, they could probably track the spaceship. Salad summons some of his drones, sending them all out in different directions. He tells Shin to give him a second. And then the drones communicate with him. This is the great thing about technology. Sensing Bobbidi and Debora was pretty hard, but locating the tech was pretty easy with Salad's own tech. He's found the ship, and he sees energy signatures on there. This definitely has to be him. Whatever this is, it's too advanced to be human technology. And this might be even better. They can launch a sneak attack. Shin warns them again at Debora, but Salad's not too concerned. This will be the first time he gets a real fight in his perfect form. At least, he hopes so. From the data his drones gathered, Debora might not be as big of a threat as they're making it. He and Piccolo head over there, trying to keep as low of a profile as possible. Shin and Kabito follow along too, and just as quickly as they get there, they open fire. Bobbidi and Debora aren't even aware of what's happening. The two of them are conversing, trying to figure out what Spopovich and Yamu are going to do. And amidst their talk, Bobbidi just explodes. Like, out of nowhere. It actually completely catches Debora off guard too. And immediately after, he's hit by a blast as well. Both Piccolo and Salad are above, launching extremely quick and powerful blasts. Since Bobbidi is the mastermind and the weaker one, it seemed like it would be easier to take him out this way. And these did catch Debora off guard and injure him a bit, but he's still alive. Not only is he confused, but he's pissed off. He launches up towards the two of them. And this is a scenario about me and Dragon Ball. So, you already know where this is going. There's no Boo Saga. 
Tabora gets into a fight with these two and it's definitely not going to go his way. This was a much smarter choice than what Shin and Kibito were playing. And just for good measure, Babidi's ship as well as the rest of his henchmen are destroyed too. Shin and Kibito are actually amazed at how well that worked out. Is it really over that easily? They thank Salad and Piccolo, taking Boo's egg somewhere safe. They will definitely be in contact in the future. These mortals are pretty amazing. The two of them depart back to the sacred world of Kai's as Piccolo and Salad go back to the world tournament, making it back just in time before it even starts. Spobovich and Yamo are still there too, but with Bobbity now gone, they're no longer under his control. They're just confused as to why they're there and what they're doing, and they end up dropping out of the tournament. The tournament continues on like normal, and I could spend time covering all the matches, but that would take pretty long since I want to get to other things in this video. But we are going to get to the finale of this tournament. The final battle ends up being between Goku and Sal. Goku has definitely grown a lot, but Salad also has as well. Even though he hasn't been training much, he has so much data on everyone that he uses to his advantage. That's how he got this far, beside his own raw power. Had he been training more, he definitely would have grown at a more insane rate. But the thing that makes this really tricky for Goku is that Salad knows everything about his fighting style. This goes for everyone else too. I mean, remember how Salad was made in the first place? He has the data of all these people. He's watched them grow and improve as well, as well as having some of their DNA too. The fight starts with Goku in base, and not much happens here. He immediately goes into Super Saiyan, and then even Super Saiyan 2. But even with that, he's not making a dent in Salad. Granted, his attacks are able to do some damage, but Salad knows everything about his fighting style. Although this isn't a one-way street, Goku also knows a lot about Salad's fighting style as well. Sure, he has data on everyone, but Goku has the knowledge of how other people fight as well. Most of Salad's fighting style comes from him and Piccolo, so Goku just needs to adjust and adapt to that. The two of them start trading blows, and it seems pretty equal at the moment. The crowd's amazed, even though they can barely keep up with what's happening and the two of them finish off this exchange of blows with a beam clash. They both realize that this fight's going nowhere, so Salad actually wants to test something. He asks Goku if he wants to try the thing from before, and Goku says it's too risky, but Salad says it's okay. If things go wrong, he'll be sure to stop Goku before it goes too bad. He just wants to have as much fun as possible, and so does Goku. Goku's a bit iffy on it, but he ends up going along with it. In his hand, Salad creates an artificial moon. Even though Goku doesn't have a tail, Remember, the two of them have been working on this together all the while, and they figured out a way to make this work even without a tail. This is basically the same as his Blutz Wave machine, but turned into a technique. Although it does require a ton of energy, so only he could use it right now. Which kind of doesn't really work in his favor since it doesn't help him, but it helps Goku. He lifts his hand up and launches the giant artificial moon, yelling at all the Saiyans to look away as well, even Goten and Trunks. He doesn't want to risk anything with them. To the amazement of everyone in the crowd, Goku then transforms into a great ape. He does have pretty good control over this by now. And just to be safe, Salad destroys the artificial moon. But they really need to be careful. The next thing that he wants Goku to do might be a bit dangerous. And at the first sight of any danger, he's going to power up to his maximum power and stop Goku. Of course, a lot of the people in the crowd are reminded of this. Another tournament with a giant monkey showing up? Last time that happened, they lost a moon. And everyone's pretty concerned. But also intrigued. This is awesome. It's scary, but cool. Goku then powers up, turning into a Super Saiyan while he's a great ape. And he doesn't do anything. He doesn't attack Salad, and he doesn't even move at all. He's just trying to keep himself under control. Salad tells Goku to focus on him. Control that power. Fight as this golden great ape. They've tried this form before, and both times that they have, it ended with Goku going on a rampage, so Salad's ready to stop him when he needs to. But something different happens this time. Goku's completely still for a bit, and then he begins shrinking. Wait, what? Salad's confused. He's never seen this before. He just assumes that Goku figured out how to use this form with control, and maybe he's just turning back into his base form but something completely different's happening. There's an awakening within Goku, something that he knew he could achieve eventually. This is why he's been training towards this. He keeps shrinking and shrinking, and he's not going into his base form. Standing in the middle of the ring is Goku, but now he's covered in red fur and still has his tail. His hair is longer as well. He looks completely unrecognizable. Everyone's taken aback by it. Vegeta and Gohan look on it with amazement. Is this what they've been training towards? No, it can't be. This has to be the first time Goku's used that. They would have known by now. Damn, they kinda wish that they started training with this too. Salad looks at Goku, and Goku's just as amazed. He has complete control. He's stronger. This is so much stronger than Super Saiyan 2, or even that one other Super Saiyan form that they access in their training. Although, this doesn't have that key drain. Goku has unlocked Super Saiyan 4, and he's completely conscious and aware right now. Now it's time for a fight to commence. Salad goes into Kaioken. He's just at a low level right now. He wants to test where Goku's power is. He tells Goku to come at him with everything he's got and Goku obliges. He launches up towards Salad, hitting him directly with a punch, and this actually does damage Salad quite a bit. This power is incredible. This is way more than what he could have ever expected. Goku continues hitting him with a flurry of punches, and Salad can't even fight back. Even when he tries to read Goku's movements, he's fighting too fast, and he's too strong regardless. All right, he powers up Kaioken even more, and this makes the battle a bit more even. Thankfully, Salad can use Kaioken without too much issue, 
Infinite energy and regeneration helps him, but there is one drawback to this. Kaioken still does destroy his body, and even though he's regenerating and not losing energy, there's still the fact that his body is constantly being destroyed. At a certain point, Kaioken dramatically buffs his offense, but it has an inverse relationship with his defense. Of course, he is recovering continuously, but since his body is in a constant state of recovery, his defenses aren't that great. But it's a worthy trade-off. He thinks his speed and offense will be enough to fight Goku here. The two begin clashing, and no one can see what's happening besides their friends. The announcer tries to decipher what's going on. Everyone just feels shockwaves, and they're all pretty hyped up too even though they can't see what's happening. There's just big flashes of light in the sky followed by gusts of wind. The two are amazed by this power, and Goku still needs to get the hang of it. Salad maxes out Kaioken. He tells Goku they should finish this now and truly test how far this power goes. Goku powers up too, and the two launch towards each other. But as Goku launches towards him, he also launches a Kamehameha, and not just a normal one, it's a scatter Kamehameha. Multiple beams of energy surround Goku as he flies towards Salad. Salad puts up a barrier to try to defend against them, and Goku punches right through it, and then all of his attacks hit Salad. Salad's able to punch him, and Goku definitely feels it. His offensive abilities are insane right now, but he knows he can exploit that low defense. More blasts hit Salad as Goku jumps up in the air. He then rockets down at amazing speeds. He has a fist out in front of him, and he hits Salad directly, then bouncing off him and landing back in the ring. Salad's thrown right into the ground. He gets up, ready to continue the fight, and then looks where he is. He's outside of the ring. Goku actually beat him. Honestly, Goku wasn't even really intending to do that. But either way, Salad feels that Goku would've won if this fight actually did go on. This is incredible, and they're glad that they discovered this power together. It was a fun fight for the both of them, and it was a great end to the tournament. And luckily without Boo, disaster was avoided. But is Earth completely safe still, or is there another threat coming along the way? Well, soon enough there might be one. Now with the Boo saga over, or at least the tournament I guess, we go into the time skip right before Battle of Gods. Goku would continue trying to work with this power. It doesn't seem too stable right now, but if he keeps practicing with it, he could use it probably as efficiently as his other forms. And obviously it's not just gonna be him trying to use this. Gohan and Vegeta kinda want it for themselves. Mainly Vegeta, but also kinda Gohan. He is doing way more training than he would normally here, and seeing this form does get him interested. Vegeta would 100% be pursuing it right away, and not too long after, he probably would be able to unlock it. Once Goku gets a better understanding of it, he could actually give Vegeta some pointers. And over this time skip, Vegeta unlocks it and then eventually Gohan does too. And thankfully there's not too many opportunities for them to use it, there's no threats at the moment, but eventually someone does arrive on Earth, that being Beerus. And Salad sees a lot of potential here, he doesn't know if Beerus is a threat or not, but his drones are giving him a really odd reading. He usually has them around regardless, just in case there's a fight going on. And when they try to collect data on Beerus, there's nothing that comes up. His key is untraceable, as well as Whis, that guy with him. From what Vegeta says, he's a god of destruction, and that only gives everyone more ideas. Vegeta's obviously terrified, but Salad sees potential in trying to gain power, and Goku sees a potential fight. And luckily for Goku, that's actually what Beerus is here for, although they do need to find a Super Saiyan god first. But hey, in the meantime, he can at least test out everyone's powers to see if they're even worthy at all. Apparently that purple android guy is part Saiyan, also part Frieza and some other stuff too, so it could be interesting trying to fight him. Salad faces Beerus first, and Beerus noticed that he can grow exceptionally fast during battle. It seems that he's able to analyze all of Beerus' movements, gathering the data that he needs, and Salad explains this too. But beyond that, his raw skill and power is actually enough to give Beerus a nice fight, at least while suppressed. Beerus is only giving off a small fraction of his power right now, so he doesn't really expect too much out of these fights anyways. But the fact that they can even keep up with that fraction is good for him. The Super Saiyan 4 is trying to fight him too, and just like with the fight against Salad, they do offer nice fights, but they're not really too great in terms of excitement. Yeah, it's cool to see people this strong that are mortals, but they're nowhere near his level, even when he's suppressed. Salad ends up asking Beerus why he can't sense him or analyze him either. They knew they couldn't sense his key, but Salad's drones can't even pick up on what he's using. Beerus says no mere mortal or mortal technology will be able to sense this, but he has God Key, something that they could probably access if the Super Saiyan God is real. All they need to do now is find out how to do the ritual. And Salad's playing kind of a dangerous game here. He wants his drones to analyze Beerus more and more to give him more data. Maybe he can get some of Beerus' DNA, using it within him. It will be tough, and if Beerus or Whis notices the drones, for all he knows, he'll just be destroyed on the spot. But luckily, there is plenty of DNA left behind. I mean, Beerus is eating a bunch of food there. From the leftover plates or whatever, Salad's drones can gather it. He doesn't tell anyone about this, though. He wants to utilize this and maybe see if he can get this power somehow. Maybe he can get God Key by doing this. And imagine him having the powers of a god of destruction, if there even is anything that goes along with it. He still doesn't really know what it entails. He tries to get Whis' DNA too, but that doesn't actually work out. Something's really weird about that guy. Eventually, the Super Saiyan God ritual is done, and Salad's actually part of it. Videl never actually reveals that she's pregnant, because there's no need. They decide to have Salad try and join it. And since he is part Saiyan, it actually does work. The ritual is done on Goku, who becomes the Super Saiyan God. There's not too much interesting to cover about that fight, and more so the important stuff in this arc is everything outside of that. 
Watching this battle, Salad and Piccolo get pretty interested in this. God Key. They wonder if they can maybe access it somehow. Well, at least for Salad, maybe he can access the powers of a Super Saiyan God at least. He does have the ability to use Saiyan powers. But as for Piccolo, they're not really too sure. Could a Namekian harness this power too? And since Salad isn't just a Saiyan and he's all these other things too, what'll it be like for him to use God Key? What'll his God form be like if there is any that he could access? Supposedly he's already perfect, but Jiro never accounted for this. Maybe this isn't his true perfection. Maybe there's stuff beyond this that he could do. Maybe not a completely new form like his semi-perfect form or his perfect form, but he can incorporate the power into this form at least. And with Beerus' DNA, he's able to analyze it and actually access trace amounts of God Key once it's implemented within him, but it actually doesn't do too much else. I could come up with a reason by saying he's not an actual god of destruction so he can't use those powers right away, but really, I just don't want to make him too overpowered. Realistically, in this setting, I feel like he probably would try and collect all the DNA from Beerus that he could and Whis, but it wouldn't really be an interesting story if he just got Beerus' DNA and Whis' DNA and instantly got Ultra Instinct and all Hakai powers and whatever. It would really ruin the stakes for the rest of the story. It does have some benefit, but it's not going to make him that strong. Although, if he does actually work towards these powers with Beerus, it actually might help him access new powers easier than if he started from scratch. Not only do Goku and Vegeta go to train with Beerus and Whis, but Salad and Piccolo do as well. And they do go back to Earth from time to time too. They're not just on Beerus' planet 24-7. And it's actually good that Earth isn't left unattended. Of course, right now without them there, Gohan would be the strongest person there, which is still pretty good, but it's nice to have other people just in case. Who knows, what if there's some really strong threat that Gohan can't handle alone? Plus, they do like training with him and everyone else there, so they can't just stay on Beerus' planet the entire time. And this actually turned out to be a really good idea, because now, we're going to be entering a very different Resurrection F. Usually like Battle of Gods, I breeze through this very quickly, but there are going to be some changes here that change how the arc plays out, and it'll be completely different than how it was before. Frieza is eventually revived, and this time he knows not to mess around. Remember back to how easily he was defeated on Namek. Not only does he want to kill those Saiyans on Earth, but there's those other people too, that one Namekian that faced him and that purple guy. He didn't know what species that guy was, but as for that Namekian and those monkeys, they need to die. And he's being a lot more cautious here. Sure, he hates the idea of training, and he could just do a couple months of it and get it over with, but instead, he's gonna be more cautious. He's gonna train a little bit longer. And the most interesting part is he actually has a new partner this time. It's not just Frieza, they have King Cold join them too. It obviously wasn't too hard to get him. And the two are confident, they could probably unlock a new power, something strong enough to not only defeat those Earthlings and Saiyans, but whatever that other guy was too. And that Namekian that Frieza fought. Training begins, and a couple months pass. Not only do they take a little bit longer, but the fact that King Cold is there training with Frieza actually helps the growth. After these few months pass, let's go over to Earth. Salad and Piccolo are back on Earth training. They're out in the middle of nowhere. They do need a lot of space after all. The two start by sparring. Glad to see how both of them have grown. They actually do have a bit of God Key within them now. As for Piccolo, he hasn't figured out how to actually use it in terms of a form or whatever, if there even is a form that he can use. And for Salad, it's a little bit weird. He's been trying to tap into the power of a Super Saiyan God, but it's odd trying to make it work. Maybe it's because he's not really a Saiyan. Of course he does have Saiyan DNA, but his physiology, his body, it's not actually that of a Saiyan. And he has so much other stuff within him too. So in reality, he doesn't really know what he's aiming for. It's a lot of trial and error for the both of them right now. The two of them finish sparring, and they get ready to leave this area just to go and relax somewhere. But something catches them both off guard. There's a giant surge of power nearby, and the two of them turn around but it's already too late. Salad instinctively knocks Piccolo out of the way, and then he's hit head on by a powerful attack. A massive blast cuts through the area, Piccolo only narrowly avoids it, but he sees Salad standing there, with a good chunk of his body now missing. He took some serious damage, and Salad falls to the ground. Piccolo looks around and then sees, over the horizon, Frieza and King Cold fly towards them. He has no idea what's going on. Frieza's back? As Frieza suspected, the android and the Mechian did grow stronger. Had they been the same strength as before, that attack would have been enough to obliterate both of them without any effort. But they were quick enough to react, and it seems he didn't fully do the job with that android. He wonders if the monkeys got just as strong as them too. But whatever, he can't find them anywhere. He doesn't know where they're hiding, but maybe killing these two will coax them to come out of hiding. They land right in front of Piccolo and Salad. Cold allows Frieza to do the honors. Frieza stands over Salad, putting a hand out and charging a blast. It seems he's already half dead anyways. But little does Frieza know, Salad has been feigning this weakness. Now with Frieza right in front of him, he quickly regenerates an arm, striking Frieza right in the chest. And with his other arm, he grabs Frieza's hand and begins crushing it. Frieza then launches a point-blank blast to get away from him. Regeneration. Interesting. Salad warns them, the two haven't just gotten stronger in terms of physical strength, they both have been working on brand new techniques, and as for Salad, he's been upgraded in many other ways. They could obviously tell by his form. Frieza can see that he looks very different than how he did on Namek, but they don't care too much. That attack was almost enough to destroy part of Salad. Even if he can regenerate, they'll just overcome it. But they are going to need to make this quick, so they'll just slaughter everyone, and it's better to do it this way. They start transforming. Their power surge is even higher than it was before. 
It's insane, and Freezes is ahead of King Cold by a significant margin. The two are surrounded by a brilliant golden aura, and they undergo a metamorphosis into their golden forms. This might be an issue. Sal and Piccolo power up, getting ready to fight. Salad even goes into Kaioken. Judging by the power that they're giving off, he's not too sure how this is gonna go. Frieza and Cold immediately have the upper hand. Salad and Piccolo take a lot of damage from this. And Frieza and Cold are pretty pleased. Yeah, this isn't going as fast as they wanted, but hey, at least they can make these two suffer. And maybe all this energy that they're giving off will draw out those Saiyans. Piccolo and Salad are on the defensive. Their attacks aren't doing too much right now. Maybe if they're just fighting Frieza or Cold individually, the two of them would be enough. But with both of them together, it's too much to handle. They just need to hold out for a bit. Someone will sense this. Either Goku and Vegeta will get here, or even Gohan could show up. And Piccolo says that won't matter. At the rate they're going, they're gonna die like this. But Salad says it's not true. He and Piccolo are able to get some distance mid-battle, and Salad quickly tells him what's going on. His drones are analyzing those two, and it seems that their stamina is rapidly depleted. Even though their power is insane, they notice that during battle, they're slowly getting weaker and weaker, and the data shows that they're getting more and more tired out as well. And Salad wonders, maybe he can use this power for himself, circumventing whatever issues Frieza and Cole are encountering right now. But obviously the most important thing here is that they're running out of stamina. Maybe they can prolong this battle. They jump back into the fight. Frieza and Cole are actually enjoying themselves. Salad tries to take the brunt of the attacks, and even though he can regenerate, it's not like he's not taking damage. This is still very risky. He's trying to defend Piccolo as much as possible. But if Frieza and Cold Lane attack powerful enough to destroy him, they could completely kill Salad. Then, a massive geyser key ascends from below. It hits both Frieza and Cold directly, and everyone looks down. Gohan's standing there in Super Saiyan 4, with both of his arms up. Unlike the other Saiyans, he doesn't have God Key because he hasn't been training with Beerus and Whis. He did have to stay here after all. But with Super Saiyan 4 and his hybrid potential, he's actually gotten a lot stronger still. And the funny thing is too, just in Super Saiyan 4, Gohan actually surpasses Goku and Vegeta right now. Although if they go into Super Saiyan God, they're way above him. But still, this makes him a very important asset right here. Frieza and Cold even mock him. He's actually turned into a monkey. That's hilarious. But they stop laughing as soon as the three of them team up. With Gohan here, that actually helps turn the tide of the battle. It's a lot more even than before. And with King Cold and Frieza losing more and more stamina as it goes on, that does cause a lot of issues for them. Piccolo then confronts the two of them. He knows their weakness. They didn't even need the drones. At this point, it's pretty obvious to tell. They're losing more and more stamina as they fight with this form. It doesn't matter how strong they are. Eventually, the three of them will get ahead. I mean, look at Salad too. He has infinite energy. He can keep this going on forever. They can't. Frieza and Cole are pissed off. They saw right through this. But that is to be expected. Although, there is one way to end this really quickly. Of course, it's very unceremonious. But it would be a lot more efficient than what they're doing here. If they can't slaughter them this way, they'll have to do it another way now. The two then jump back from the battle, ascending up into the sky, and they each stick a hand out in front of them. A powerful ball of ki begins charging in between both of them. The ground below is beginning to burn up, even the parts that don't have any foliage. The attack grows larger and larger. Everyone feels powerful gust of wind, and an overwhelming heat. The double golden death ball is charged, and they launch it right towards the planet. If this hits Earth, it'll immediately blow up. The three try their best to defend against it, while King Cold and Frieza put more and more power into it. This is bad. It's a struggle between those three and Frieza and Cold, and those three are losing right now. The attack gets closer and closer to the planet. They put more energy into their beams, but it's doing nothing. Their arms are about to give out, and as for Piccolo and Gohan, they're about to run out of energy. But Salad gets an idea. As they strain to push this attack back, Salad then stretches out his tail, to extreme lengths too. It goes underneath the beam struggle, and it's hard to aim, but eventually he does hit something. He stabs King Cold right in the back and as quickly as he can, he tries to drain energy. As he does so, the attack from Frieza and Cold gets less and less powerful, as their beam gets stronger and stronger. With King Cold's power on their side now, they're starting to win this. King Cold tries to get the tail out of his back, and Salad uses this distraction. He splits all the energy up between the three of them, lending some to Gohan and Piccolo. The beams immediately get overloaded, completely eviscerating the blast from Frieza and Cold, and killing King Cold with his own energy. Frieza is able to barely avoid this, but as he jumps out of the way, he's met then by Gohan and Piccolo. Piccolo's behind him and Gohan's in front of him. Not knowing what to do, he charges to Gohan instinctively. Gohan places two fingers on his forehead and begins charging an attack. Just as Frieza's about to hit him, Gohan sidesteps out of the way, and a beam of light bursts through Frieza. Gohan flies over to Piccolo and launches his own Makanko Sapo. The two of them swirl together, finishing off Frieza for good. As Frieza falls to the ground, the two of them launch a Masenko together, erasing whatever's left to him just to make sure the job is done. That was a really close call. They had no warning of these two coming to Earth, especially King Cold as well. Gohan and Piccolo are pretty injured, and as for Salad, he seems okay. But this battle made him actually realize something. Sure, he could regenerate, and he has infinite energy, but he's seen something weird. He has a limit to how much power he can hold. He tells Gohan and Piccolo, the reason he gave King Cold's power to both of them is because he almost overloaded himself. Temporarily, he had a huge increase in power, 
but had he kept absorbing more energy, it would have been too much. And this worries him. If he does access a godly power like Goku or Vegeta, could his body handle it? I mean, he is partially mechanical after all. He is a bio-android, so he's different from other androids. But still, his body might not be built to handle that type of power. Unlike an organic Saiyan body, he's now concerned. Maybe this is the reason he couldn't access it, he just can't contain the power. Has he reached the limit to how strong he could get? And if so, is there a way to even overcome it? The three of them all stand there, out of breath. It's good that they took victory, but this battle also showcased the limits of their power. Gohan might need to take his training more seriously. He could grow a lot stronger if he spent more time training, even without God Key. As for Piccolo, he needs to figure out a way to enhance his power even more. And as for Salad, he did collect a lot of good data, but now he has a new issue. He thinks he might actually have a limit to how strong he can get. They need to return to Beerus' planet right away. They invite Gohan, but he's gonna stay here. God Key's nice, and maybe he could pick up on it some other time, especially with how many God Key users he associates with, but for now, it seems Earth training will be enough for him. Super Saiyan 4 is pretty good, and while Goku and Vegeta try and access brand new power, Gohan will stick with this. And even though they narrowly avoided this threat, it is definitely not the last. Once again, their next threat will be someone they faced before. One of their allies will be turned against them. So naturally up next we have the Universe 6 tournament, but honestly, I think it's fine to skip that. We all know that with the team that they have, it's gonna be a wash. Likely the team would just be Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, Piccolo, and Sal. Yeah, it's pretty overpowered, so there's no need to cover this tournament. It's gonna take up too much time to cover, and we'd rather cover this arc, because the stuff coming up next is actually gonna be really insane. This arc is almost completely unrecognizable, Besides the fact that Sal is obviously part of the story, there's a bunch of different factors that are going to come into play here. And it's going to be a lot darker than usual, so first off, let's start with some light stuff. Sal continues his training, trying to get stronger than he already is. It's weird because Jero's apparently made him perfect, but he could probably go beyond this perfection. He can utilize his god key and make a form like the Saiyans. He could use the golden form that Frieza had. He could use his Namekian abilities and maybe use something with that. Who knows? There's a lot of potential here, and he doesn't really know where he wants to go. So, what would that be, his super perfect form? If he gets something beyond perfection, yeah, I guess. He begins working towards that, and over this time period, he actually is able to unlock something. Combined with his own training, his data on Goku and Vegeta, his data on Beerus and Whis, and even his data on Frieza. He's been researching, he's using science to try and figure out the best way for him to transform. What could he do, and what could he use? In the last part, Salad was worried about his limits. But after all this time training and trying to figure out something new, that's not a worry anymore. He has a brand new form which he just dubs his super perfect form. Unlike what we saw for Cell where his super perfect form was just an upgraded version of himself, this actually has a noticeable change. He's combined the properties of Super Saiyan God as well as the properties of Frieza's golden form. In terms of physical changes, it's pretty small. He gains a golden aura and his eyes turn red. But not much else changes. I mean, he's perfect as is. So unlike Frieza, he's not going to try and select a new color for this form. Also, it's not like he really do that too well because part of it is from his Saiyan DNA, not something that he could choose. Think of this as his equivalent version of Super Saiyan Blue. Obviously it isn't the same, but it's his ultimate transformation and it's on par with it in that sense. So after the Universe 6 tournament, where are we now? Vegeta ends up staying on Beerus' planet to train more, while Goku returns to Earth temporarily. Little did everyone know, there was someone else watching the Universe 6 tournament, someone who got very angry by this display of godly powers. Mortals aren't time traveling here, sure, but they're making a mockery of godly power. Not to mention, they're playing Kai. They're creating their own life forms, using Dragon Balls, etc. All this stuff together is seen by Zamasu, and he's furious. It's like the mortals are trying to be gods. I mean, look at that one artificial person. Besides the fact that he's created artificially, he's using god key as well. They're trying to have machines imitate gods. And Zamasu ends up setting his sights on one particular person, one who exemplifies everything wrong with mortals, the Saiyan Goku. But something different's gonna happen here. Remember, I said there's no involvement with other timelines. Everything that's happening here is happening in this timeline. Zamasu does have to wait a bit to get the Super Dragon Balls. They were just used in the Universe 6 tournament. He could use the Time Ring, but no, that might complicate things. He's gonna wait, he's gonna bide his time, and then once the Super Dragon Balls are actually back, he'll get them for himself. And eventually, he does so. First, of course, he kills Gowasu, and then he goes out to collect the Super Dragon Balls. His wish is pretty simple. He wants his body to be swapped with Goku's. The initial swap of it goes pretty much like normal. The only difference being it's in the main timeline and not in another one. He's successful, Goku's body is stolen, and Goku dies giving birth to Goku Black. And there's a big issue. He realized that if he encounters everyone at once, he might be stopped right away. But as far as he knows, Vegeta's off on Beerus' planet right now. And if he's able to work quickly, he'll be able to perform a sneak attack and kill the strongest mortals here. Goku Black's first target is Piccolo, one of the strongest people he could find at first. Piccolo has no idea what's going on. As soon as he sees Goku Black, he's immediately obliterated. That's one strong fighter gone. He just needs to get rid of Gohan, Salad, and Vegeta. And luckily, Vegeta's not a concern right now. With Piccolo being killed, Everyone else is able to obviously sense this, and Goku Black immediately begins enacting the Zero Mortals plan here. He wastes no time, 
he starts obliterating cities. Some of the Earthlings on the Dragon Team try and fight him, but of course they're no match. Krillin, Tenshin Han, Yamcha. But two people are able to make a bit of a stand, Gohan and Sao. It's seeming hopeless. They've already lost so many of their friends. It's up to them to stop this, and they have options. They could fight here, or they could retreat and figure something out. Maybe the two of them together would be enough to face Goku, but they still don't know what's going on. If this is Goku, or if it's an imposter or something. And because of that, they don't know his true power. Sure, Goku Black is strong as is in his base form, but he doesn't have access to anything else. But they don't want to take that risk. Assuming this is actually Goku, they feel like he'd have access to Super Saiyan Blue. Fighting him right now might be pointless. Gohan is enraged, and he eventually does end up trying to fight Goku Black. He's nearly killed in the process, and gets very close to death, but Salad is able to save him in the nick of time. He ends up having to split himself in half, with one getting Gohan out of there, and one copy trying to distract Goku Black. They're only barely able to escape, and it's hard too. They have to go out in space where Gohan can't survive. They need to get away from Earth for the time being until Beerus and Whis can find them. In the remains of Capsule Corp, there is a capsule that they could use, one that has a spaceship within it. Quickly, they escape before Goku Black notices, going out into space and trying to figure out what to do next. This all happens so quick, and they don't know what's going on. Everyone's dying. In terms of Goku Black himself, they don't know who he is. He clearly isn't Goku, his key feels different, and there's something weird about his demeanor. There's no reason for Goku to just turn evil immediately. Gohan is unconscious now incredibly injured as well. He doesn't even know that the rest of his family is dead. He was just lashing out in response to the others. Salad is just as mad, but he tries to stay focused. They gotta figure out what's going on and get away out of here. Luckily, they're able to get in contact with Whis, who then picks them up and brings them back to Beerus' planet. Vegeta is completely confused. Why are they here and why is Gohan all beat up? Thankfully, Whis is able to heal him. Beerus sent some weird fighting on Earth, but he assumed that it might have been training. They try and explain what's happening, but they still have no idea of what's going on either. Goku turned evil or something, or someone's pretending to be Goku and is destroying everything. They have no clue of what's going on, and they don't know who's still alive. Most of the Z fighters are dead. Gohan doesn't know if his family's okay, and he wanted to get them out of there, but there was no chance. Vegeta's concerned too. What about his family? He's immediately enraged at the two of them, and he even has a bit of an outburst for them not being able to protect everyone. But the two of them fight back, telling Vegeta who they were up against. This came out of nowhere. It was Goku attacking everyone. That power is something that they can't work against. And even when Salad did try attacking with his full power, Goku Black was just able to teleport away somehow, using the Kai Kai, which they don't even know he had access to. Even if they could attack him and do some damage, they don't know if it would be enough, and he might be able to easily retreat from it. Vegeta calms down, apologizing. He realizes that it isn't their fault, but he's still just concerned. If they can, they gotta figure out who else is alive. Is Bulma okay? Chi Chi? Goten? Trunks? Anyone? Vegeta immediately wants to go back to Earth, but Salad says it's too dangerous. It's a guy using Goku's body, and he's probably grown stronger already. Of course, Goku Black doesn't have Zamasu here to help him, so it's not like he can heal himself up right away. But considering he's in the present version of Earth, it wouldn't be too hard for him to maybe find a stash of Senzu beams. He is in Goku's body after all and wouldn't know where to find them, taking one right now and immediately healing himself, getting a lot stronger in the process. Salad even tried to analyze him too. One of his drones got some data, and it 100% was Goku's body. But they noticed a few distinct features that have changed about him. Of course, his outfit's different, obviously. But his drones found some sort of ring that he was wearing, and he had an earring that Kai's would wear, the Patara. Well, that might be good, maybe they can go to the Kai's for answers. If they contact Shin and Kibito, maybe they'll be able to figure out something. But then, something even weirder happens. Beerus suddenly disappears. They look at Whis and ask what's going on. He says he can no longer be of service. Someone has killed the Supreme Kai, which means Beerus has died too, since the two are lifeless. With the God of Destruction dead, there's no need for an angel here anymore. Whis is forbidden to help, and he even leaves Universe 7. What the hell just happened? Vegeta, Salad, and Gohan are just standing there on Beerus' planet. They have no idea of what to do. They don't even know how to get off here now. What Whis has said, that, that can't be true, is it? They're all a little bit panicked right now, too. Shin died, and Beerus is dead, too? They can't figure out what's going on, and they don't know how they're going to get any help, either. Thankfully, they're all healed up at the moment, but they don't know what they're supposed to do now in terms of transport. They can't find Goku Black themselves. Whis was the way they got here and back, and they're in a completely different realm from where they were before. So, even if they had a spaceship, it's not like they can get to Earth or anything. This is bad. Really bad. This all feels like a nightmare. What's going on? There's been so many casualties, so much loss so far, and it's not like they even know what's happening either, which is the worst part. But then, their worst fears are realized. About a day or so after, somebody then arrives on the planet. It's Goku, or Goku Black, whoever that is. And he's pretty amused. So that's where these guys went. That's funny, they must have run to Beerus and Whis for help. Ah, well, it's of no use. He says they did kill shit, and it seems that did the job. Beerus isn't here anymore, nor is Whis. And he tells them something even better. He's getting a better grasp on Goku's body. Thanks to that fight between him, Gohan, and Salad, he got a pretty sizable increase in power afterwards. And his anger grew even more too, allowing him to get more control over his own strength. He was having a bit of trouble at first trying to access this, but now he doesn't need to rely on his base form anymore. He's actually figured out a way to transform, and he decides he'll show it off to them. It would be a nice thing for them to see right before they die. This can't be happening. 
The group prepares, trying to get ready for the fight, but they don't know what to expect. Goku Black transforms. He's surrounded by a dark pinkish and purplish aura. It looks as if he's going Super Saiyan, but his hair is pink instead of yellow. This is what he refers to as Super Saiyan Rose. The Zero Mortals plan is making some great progress so far. He just needs to get rid of these three and then he can go on to other universes. And for all he knows, this fight will make him even more powerful than before. He'll be completely unstoppable. He's growing at such a rapid pace, he didn't even expect this himself. His soul and body will completely merge. He'll have full control over Goku's powers and even more beyond them. Vegeta goes Super Saiyan Blue, and Gohan turns Super Saiyan 4, with Salad going into his new super perfect form. They're holding nothing back, and they immediately jump into the battle. Salad says that they don't know what to expect. They already did try planning, but they didn't realize this was going to happen so soon. Since Salad has infinite energy, he wants the other two to conserve their stamina. They don't know if they'll get a chance to be healed, or a way to even get off this planet. Every little bit of their energy counts. So, Salad leads the charge. And with the three of them together, Goku Black actually is having some trouble. Damn, this might be a bit too premature. But it's fine, he allows it to happen. As he gets beat up more and more, his power grows. With all the damage he sustains, he grows stronger and stronger, as well as getting angrier and angrier. More of his power becomes unleashed. And it's still not enough to counter the three of them together, especially once he's getting more and more injured. But Goku Black has a backup plan, or a few of them actually. In his pocket, he pulls out a bag. They immediately realize what it is. He has Senzu beans. He takes one of them, completely restoring him to full health. And with the damage he sustained and how close to death he was just now, he grows so much stronger too. Super Saiyan Rose grows more powerful, especially with the anger that he's feeling too. This guy's a monster. But they question, asking him what he is and what he's even doing. If he's really set on killing them, at least give them an answer. They want to coax this information out of him. So they try and act defeated. And Goku Black explains. He tells them everything. He was originally a Kai from Universe 10. He was disgusted with the deeds of mortals and decided he wants to wipe them out. Thus, the Zero Mortals plan. He's gonna start here first, and once he gets strong enough to, he's gonna go around the other universes, killing all the mortals and even the gods of destruction. By killing the Supreme Kai's, this would be very easy. He was already successful in Universe 10. He just needs to finish the job here. Of course, there are stronger mortals in other universes. But if he can defeat these three fighters and grow stronger in the process, anything else won't be a problem. So he's eliminating every single mortal. He spared no one. Well, yeah, it's the Zero Mortals plan after all. And then he begins laughing. Oh, they're wondering about their families. He turns to Gohan. When he stole Goku's body, the first kill was Goku himself. Of course, he's in Goku's body right now, but Goku was bonded to Zamasu's original body. He quickly disposed of Goku. It was an unceremonious death. What's better is that Chi-Chi and Goten were watching too. They died alongside him. His wife and daughter are probably dead as well. I mean, he did kill everyone on Earth, and he turns to Vegeta. He made very sure that at Capsule Corp everyone died. He wanted to check if Vegeta was there after all. So Bulma and Trunks, yeah, they're gone too. He tries to continue explaining to Vegeta, but then he's immediately hit in the face by Gohan. Salad feels an immense power coming from him, and he looks over to Vegeta too. At the same time, Vegeta screams. In a blind outburst of rage, they keep attacking Goku Black together, and then they stop for a brief moment, powering up beyond where they even were before. Salad knew they'd have a reaction like this, but not this explosive. Vegeta's auras change, it's become darker, as has his hair. He's bulked up in size as well. And as for Gohan, his Super Saiyan 4 form has changed. He's surrounded by an intense red glow, and his hair is red as well. And both are consumed by rage. Their eyes have gone completely white as well. They're fighting completely based on their anger. Vegeta's in Blue Evolution, and Gohan's in Super Saiyan 4 Limit Breaker. The two begin fighting Goku Black together. Goku Black has no time to even fight back. Even with how strong he just got, he's made a mistake. He's made a really big mistake. He's enraged both of them to the point where they unlocked a new power beyond where they were before. And with their combined effort and the fact that they're attacking so relentlessly, Goku Black can't find an opening for himself. He even tries to get a Senzu bead mid-battle, but with Salad being the only one with a clear mind right now, he quickly stretches an arm out, grabbing it from Goku Black as Vegeta and Gohan continue attacking. This is bad. He's gonna die here. He even tries lifting up his hand to use the time ring, but as soon as he does, his arm gets completely shattered. He can't even lift it now. The two continue fighting him, and it's not even a fight anymore, it's just a one-sided beatdown. They're unleashing all their anger, and together, they finish it off with a blast. The two get back to back. Gohan charges up a massive Kamehameha, and it's reddish in color, while Vegeta places his hands forward and launches a Gamma Burst Flash. The two attacks swirl together, forming into a menacing glow that changes the color of the entire planet. A massive divot is left behind, and Goku Black is nowhere to be seen. They did it. They've killed him. Of course, that means they destroyed Goku's body in the process. But in their fit of rage, there was nothing else they could do. And even if they were in a clear state of mind, it's not like they could have done anything to fix this. So, they've eliminated the threat, but what do they do now? Gohan and Vegeta are both infuriated. Both of their families have been completely wiped out. Their friends are dead too. And as far as they know, everyone else on Earth might be dead as well. And who knows how far the damage extends? Goku Black had an entire few days to do this. Maybe he's been to other planets before Earth. Maybe he went to some after killing Shin and Kibito. Not only are they the only inhabitants of Earth left, but they might be the only inhabitants of Universe 7 left. And there's no way of them to know otherwise. They're stuck on this planet now. They have no way of getting off it or going into a different realm to get back to Earth. 
And even if they did get back, if Goku Black actually killed all these other mortals, there's not gonna be Dragon Balls on Earth. There's not gonna be Dragon Balls on Namek. Hell, there's probably not even Super Dragon Balls left. What the hell are they supposed to do? Sure, they've claimed victory over Goku Black, but their entire universe is in ruins, and they're stranded in a completely unreachable location. They don't know how far the damage extends, or how to reverse it. After that explosive battle, it's oddly calm on the planet. No one even says anything. Vegeta and Gohan are still fuming, but they just stand there. And even Salad, who was in a clear mind before, he doesn't even know how to feel. Vegeta just collapses down to his knees, staring off blankly into the divot where Goku Black was. There's only one way for him to describe the situation they're in. To put it bluntly, they're screwed. We're left in a pretty dire situation right now, and I've started using different titles for my videos recently, as well as naming original arcs in the story. And I think I have a pretty fitting name for this arc. There's only a few heroes left, against insurmountable odds, trying to fix widespread multiversal damage. And it's the finale, so what better name than Endgame? I'll let you figure out the reference for yourself, and this will be called the Endgame arc. A simple, yet effective name. We pick off exactly where we left off last time. Gohan, Salad, and Vegeta are stuck on Beerus' planet. They're basically in a state of disbelief right now. They all feel a mix of anger, sadness, and defeat. And also, how are they supposed to get off this planet? They defeated Goku Black, but what are they supposed to do now? Salad summons some of his drones. He wants to see what kind of data they collected on Goku Black. In terms of strength, he's not expecting to get anything interesting. I mean, it is Goku's body, and he already has all the data on that. But he has a great idea. There might be a way out of here. Goku Black, he, he was teleporting around. Maybe they can get that for themselves. And sure enough, the drones actually do have enough data on him, including DNA. Salad just needs to integrate that with himself, and now he has access to the Kai Kai. Things are still looking pretty grim, but at least they're not stuck on this planet. And also with this, they can actually check how much of the universe is actually destroyed. Is it all of it? Is it just part of it? Was Goku Black bluffing at all? First, he tries to get used to this technique. Instead of honing onto different energies, he could just actually teleport anywhere he wants. So he goes around to places that he knows, but only places that he's been to before has heard him. He stops by multiple different planets, and they're all empty. Even Namek, which might have had some Dragon Balls. Of course, Goku Black thought of this, though. He destroyed every set of Dragon Balls that he knew of. Earths, Namek's, and of course, the Super Dragon Balls. He teleports back to Beerus' planet, bringing the other two back to Earth with him. The damage is insane. Not only can they not sense anyone, but there's nothing even around. They arrive in a city, and they can't even tell that it was a city. It's completely flattened. You wouldn't have even known a city was here despite a few structures still standing. The three of them fly high in the air, looking around over the horizon. There's nothing. Everything's been flattened. All pieces of civilization are gone. But he can't have destroyed everything and everyone, right? There has to be some people that survived. Some people that got by and survived through this. It's going to be very hard to check, though. With how widespread the damage is and what kind of people they're searching for, it's going to be incredibly tough. Especially with only three of them. Gohan brings this up, too. There's no way he actually killed everyone, right? There has to be some people he forgot about, some planets that he didn't go by. And maybe on places like Namek, or even here on Earth, there's still people alive, but they can't spend their time checking that right now. It would be great if they had some extra people here. Extra people. Salad has an idea. It's a technique, something he's kind of known about for a while but has never really had a use for. As a project of Jero's, this is something that was already within him. And he begins doing something weird. His tail stretches out and then drops a few things out of it. Did he, did he just shit himself? But similar to how Cell can create Cell Juniors, Salad created miniature clones of himself. He looks on triumphantly. He's always wanted kids. Gohan and Vegeta are completely confused, but Salad explains. Someone in the comments on one of my last videos suggested this, so I'm gonna go with it. The Cell Juniors are gonna be named after different Salad dressings. One will be named Caesar, one will be named Balsa, and one will be named Set. Does this matter? No, not right now, but I'm not gonna let that idea go to waste. It's awesome. The three Salad Juniors are all sent out, trying to search for any sort of life that they could find. But Vegeta then comments, Maybe there's other planets that they could check. I mean, they're just talking about the ones that they know of. There's gotta be other planets with life, right? And if anything, Vegeta would know better than any of them. He's been to so many different places in his life. Of course, he did eradicate most of the people on these planets. But they're not all completely wiped out. Or at least they shouldn't be if Goku Black didn't get to them. And Salad wonders. Maybe there's planets with other Namekians on them. Oh yeah, they never even considered that. He is part Namekian after all, with knowledge of those who are fused into it. So he tries to access those memories. Maybe he could find something. Something about any other Namekians. Of course, there was one that didn't stay on Namek and ended up going to Earth. The one who eventually turned into Kami and King Piccolo. But he wasn't the only one. There might be others. Some around the universe. He racks his brain. Or the brains of all the Namekians within him. And one strange name pops in his head. He doesn't know the significance of it, but he tells it. It's just one word. Cereal. Cereal? Like the breakfast food? He has no idea why this popped in his mind. But Vegeta, he knows the significance of this. Well, it's a stretch, but he knows this name. There's a planet out there called Planet Cereal. He knows because the Saiyans went there, killing most of the inhabitants. 
What if that's why Salad's thinking of it? What if what if there's a person there, a Namekian? But this is a really big assumption. Even if it is true, this assumes that the planet is still around and that there's still people on it. And Vegeta questions Salad. He couldn't feel any strong energy, right? Yeah, strong energy. He tried to survey the universe, and of all those different planets he teleported to, he only went to places he knew and places where he sent strong energy before. There could be people laying low, which is why he had the Salad Juniors going to find humans. They're surprised that this planet is even intact in the first place. They thought Goku Black blew it up. But maybe he actually did leave the different planets intact, and they just have to look around to see if they're survivors. Vegeta has a bad feeling about this. Maybe there is life on Serial, but that would be an issue for them. He tells Salad and Gohan about what happened with the Saiyans and planet Serial. Combine that with the fact that the person that they see causing issues is another Saiyan, or at least they think so, and they're not going to really be that welcoming of them. But this is under the big assumption still that the planet is round and that there's people on. But Salad says it's worth a shot. They spend some time trying to seek out the planet. Salad needs to focus. They're able to find it, and he teleports the three of them to planet Serial. Thankfully with the Kai Kai, he doesn't need to lock onto any sort of energy. But when he gets there, he feels very low powers. Does that mean there's people alive here? This is good, this means that Goku Black didn't actually get a hold of every single planet. He only went to the ones that he knew had strong fighters. But that begs the question, is that Namekian still here, if there even ever was one? The three of them fly over a city, looking down and seeing a very peaceful civilization. Vegeta realizes what this is, these are the Shigarians, the people who got this planet after the Cerulean's were killed. Vegeta then suddenly feels a sharp pain, plummeting towards the ground, with no one knowing what just happened. Gohan and Salad are now on guard, and they're barely able to dodge a blast coming towards them. They go down towards the ground, finding Vegeta. He's okay, but he seems to be temporarily paralyzed. And just as they find him, more blasts launch towards them. They don't know where they're coming from or who they're coming from. But Vegeta knows exactly what this is. One of them's still alive. This is what he feared. Out from a nearby forest, they see a figure, and they sense this power. Someone that strong is still alive. The man jumps out. He aims two fingers at them. But with them now on guard, they're ready for whatever's about to happen. It's Granola. He hasn't made a wish yet, but he still is very strong even beforehand. This is shown in the manga, a lot of people think he was weak before he made the wish, but that's not the case. Combine that with his great abilities, and yeah, he's still a fearsome opponent even before he makes that wish. Salad and Gohan come to find the Sap. They start fighting him. His attacks don't seem too strong in comparison to theirs, especially once both of them transform. But he's able to hit them in vital points. His attacks aren't crazy, but they're aimed at just the right spot. They try and calm him down, trying to explain what's happening, but Granola won't hear it. He saw two Saiyans here, and he knows that it's trouble. And he doesn't know what that purple guy is. After some time, Vegeta is eventually able to stand up, recollecting himself, and he's about to join the fight, but someone then walks up to him. He's speechless. It's a Namekian. Granola senses this, looking down and seeing Manido then. No one says anything until Manido breaks the silence. These two, they're Saiyans, right? And that guy, he doesn't look like it, but he could feel Namekian blood coursing through him. What's going on here? Sal begins explaining who they are, and what happened and why they're here. Granola doesn't believe any of it. He still is wary of the two Saiyans and would rather kill them right now. But Manido begins explaining. A Saiyan actually did save Granola. A bunch is explained. Salad explains to Manido that he's part Namekian. Gohan and Vegeta explain who they are, and they talk about Goku Black. Granola can't believe any of this. And his planet was still spared somehow, which is good, but what the hell happened to the rest of the universe? And he doesn't believe what he hears about the Saiyans. There's no way. But Manido continues explaining. It was a Saiyan named Bardock that saved them. Vegeta recognized this name, Bardock. He heard it from Raditz before. He was a low-class warrior. He was... Goku and Raditz's his father. Manido has no idea who that is, but Vegeta then explains. He points to Gohan. That's Bardock's grandson. Wait, they know his biological grandfather? He's never heard anything about him, so this is pretty shocking news. Not that he really cares too much, but it does definitely come as a surprise. This helps them trust the group even more. And they hear that Gohan's actually not fully a Saiyan. He's part Earthling, too. Well, that monkey form would have fooled them, but once he transforms back into his normal self, he does seem a lot less threatened. Manido sees why they're here. They want help from the Dragon Balls. If there's an Namekian here, that means there's still Dragon Balls. Salad has vague knowledge of how to make Dragon Balls, but with how limited it is, and the fact that he never practiced it, he knows that not only would he likely not be able to make them, but even if they did, they wouldn't be able to restore this kind of damage. But Manido, he's a lot older, he's probably more experienced and knows how to make good Dragon Balls. Well, that's the thing. He's already made them. Yeah, they do exist. But there's only two of them, one of which is already in their possession. The other one isn't too hard to find. And given what they're gonna wish for, Manido is fine with letting them have the Dragon Balls. Granola still doesn't know what to think of all this, but he slowly starts warming up to everyone, seeing that they're actually working for a noble cause, which is surprising for two Saiyans. This is going a lot better than expected. It, it can't be that easy, can it? It's just two Dragon Balls and they summon a dragon and they could reverse everything. They summon Toranbo. He looks way different than Shenron, but they could definitely tell that this is exactly what they're looking for. Their wish is a pretty heavy one. Restore all the damage that Zamasu caused to the multiverse. Toranbo says this is way beyond his power. Although... He has a suggestion. If they want the Super Dragon Balls back, he could do that. 
Oh yeah, well, they can wish for that, they'll just get the Super Dragon Balls and fix everything that way. So they wish for it, and Tarambo says there is a condition. This wish is still a very powerful one. It's not beyond his power, but he requires something else for it. We saw this when Granola made his wish in the main story. There was a condition. His life would be shortened, but in exchange, he would get his wish. And given the immense power of the Super Dragon Balls and the kind of thing that he would need to restore them, he needs to get energy from somewhere. Someone is going to have to make a sacrifice. What kind of sacrifice does he mean? For a wish of this scale, and knowing what the Super Dragon Balls can and will be used for, they need as much power as possible to be restored. And indirectly, this means that the new set will be controlled by Manida, and he definitely does not have the power for them. But there is one payment that Taranvo can use, someone's life. Someone must pay with their life, and with that life, he'll use that power to restore the Super Dragon Balls. So, one of them needs to die for this? Manado says there's no other way. Even if they use Taranbo to bring back other sets of Dragon Balls, there's no way Shenron or Paranga could fix this. Taranbo's probably the only one who can't, although he does have the condition with his wish. I mean, consider what they're trying to do. They need to restore all the life in Universe 7 and Universe 10 that was killed, alongside Universe 6 because he had to go there to destroy some of the Super Dragon Balls. And that's just what they know about. Extensive damage across at least three different universes, not to mention they need to revive the different gods, and by restoring the damage that Zamasu did, that includes restoring Goku's body and having his soul brought back to that one. Even if they made these wishes separately, they would need the power of the Super Dragon Balls, so they need to bring them back and this seems to be the only way. What are they supposed to do now? Well, considering the scope of the wish, they're all fine with giving up their lives. I mean, it's important, but who's gonna do it? And one person steps up, turning to Tarambo and making the wish. Vegeta and Gohan turn around, seeing that Salad is there in front of the dragon making this wish. He turns to the two of them, giving them a thumbs up. It's worthwhile. He doesn't need to do this, there, there has to be some other way, right? No, it's just like Manido said, there is no other way. It's strange too. You would have never thought, an android created by Dr. Jiro. The fact that he's trying to save the universe now. No, the multiverse. Salad's always wanted to turn against Jiro. He's always wanted to do everything to defy his orders. And what bigger defiance of Jiro's orders than actually restoring the entire multiverse? This is perfect. It's not only the right thing to do, but it gives Salad more fulfillment. He's moved way past the guilt of being a Red Ribbon Android, so it's not like he needed to do this. But still, he feels it's his responsibility. Not to mention, he wants to bring his friends back. Goku, Piccolo, the people that helped make him like this, as well as everyone else. He feels like he owes it to them. Gohan's too young to do this. He has so much of his life ahead of him. And as for Vegeta, he can't let Vegeta do that either. He has his family, and after all the progress he made as a Saiyan becoming an Earthling, Sala doesn't want that to go to waste. But he wishes the two of them the best. Someday, they'll meet again. But this... This is what he needs to do. The wish is made, and they watch. Sala begins glowing, smiling and waving as he then disappears. Did that actually just happen? Well, to confirm it, they look up in the sky. They feel a great rumbling. Every inhabitant of the planet is speechless. They see not too far in the distance, giant spheres. They're, they're Dragon Balls, the Super Dragon Balls. With the power that he's just been granted, Manido knows exactly how to make the wish. It actually worked, the Super Dragon Balls are back. And with the Dragon Balls in this location, there's no better opportunity. Granola, Gohan, and Vegeta bring him up to the sky, trying to get him as close to the Dragon Balls as possible. He begins speaking the language. The wish is simple yet effective. Restore all the damage caused by Zamasu. And Super Shenron knows exactly the intentions of this wish. Across multiple universes, planets are restored. Lives are brought back. The gods return. Everything and everyone is brought back besides Zamasu himself. And Goku's even back, in his original body. The Super Dragon Balls spread out, and it seems like they did it. It cost Salad his life, but they might have restored the damage. Granola then says something surprising. They're gonna need a way back home now, right? Do they want him to give them a ride? Granola still has very conflicted feelings, but after seeing this act of nobility from all of them, he knows that they're not the bad guys. No, they're the exact opposite. Gohan, Vegeta, and Manido board Granola's ship, and he flies them back to Earth. Back on Earth, everyone is just confused. Weren't they just all eradicated not too long ago? And Goku especially feels weird. He's back in his normal body now. He tries sensing his friends, but he can't find Vegeta, Gohan, or Salad anywhere. But everyone else, they seem okay. After a lot of confusion and searching, a few days after, Vegeta and Gohan finally show up. That's great, they found these two, they thought they were dead and not brought back. But no, they were actually the only ones that survived. But what about Salad? What happened with him? And also, who's this other Namekian and that green-haired guy with them? They begin explaining everything that happened, what Goku Black did, how they defeated him, and how they restored everything. They're amazed to hear this, but also sad. Specifically Goku and Piccolo, they're the most saddened of all. But that sadness is only temporary. This was the right thing to do. And Salad was happy doing it, so they should be happy too. But then, something weird happens. They sense Salad's energy. No, this isn't his energy, but it's similar. But it's not coming from one source, it's coming from three different sources. They look up in the sky. Three people are flying over. Vegeta and Gohan completely forgot. Even though Salad may be gone, a legacy does remain. 
Caesar, Balsa, and Sen show us. Salad may have had to give up his life, but the Salad Juniors, they still remain. He might be gone, but not entirely. Even though they mourn, they can't be sad forever. Things may have turned out better than they could have expected. But now with this, what lies ahead in the future? Well, like I said, I feel like this is a fitting ending. So, this is where we'll leave off for now. If there truly is enough interest, I might go into GT down the line, but that would be a while away. Without Salad part of the story anymore, it wouldn't really feel fitting continuing it without him. Although we do have the Salad Juniors. So, let me know below. Would you like this to continue into GT? And more importantly, what did you think about this part and this series as a whole? Leave your thoughts and suggestions in the comments below. I'll be sure to check them out to see what you guys think. As always, if you liked the video, be sure to drop a like. And let's try to hit that like goal from the beginning of the video because it really helps out the channel and it'll let me know you want to see more videos like this one. If you haven't already, why not subscribe? As well as hitting the bell icon so you're notified about any future uploads on my channel, including more videos like this one. Anyways, thank you all for watching, thanks for supporting the scenario all the way through, and I'll see you all on my next video.